to the December 14th meeting of the Northampton Special Act Charter Drafting Committee. Um, this is a meeting where we invited some guests to come and speak about some of the issues and talk about um, for the first two public boards, and we'll be hearing from those later. Uh, my name is Dave Stevens. I have been asked to chair this process. I want to start over in the corner and have our committee members introduce themselves. Uh, Bill Shirk, Ward 4. Helen Miranda, Ward 6. Richard Green, Ward 7. Gail Coleman, Ward 1. Stephen Goldrick, no Ward. I'm calling after you, Mass. Madeline Weaver, Ward 3. Todd Thompson, Ward 2. Mark Warner, Ward 5. Mary Madura, License Commissioner, City Council. Steve is our consultant and has been hired to help facilitate the process. Uh, we have scheduled public comment um, and we, we have members of the audience who would like to speak other than those invited guests who will be asking specific questions later. Is there anyone from the public who would like to comment at this time? Barry. Um, Introduce yourself, say which ward you're from, please. For the Barry, rest. Barry Roth. I'm from uh, Ward 6. Uh, prior uh, meeting, I mentioned that I felt the way in which the Charter Revision Committee was set up was, uh, was excellent in the fact that it presented both pros and cons, and that this was necessary to a proper discussion and meaningful uh, decision on any issue. Um, but now that the, uh, when, when the uh, Charter Revision Committee started to wind down, I realized that it had omitted uh, a critical aspect. And that is to say, it has focused here to date on the election of uh, representatives and their salaries and on the, on the distribution of power amongst the elected representatives. But it, it omitted one of the most critical things that, uh, that affect the way the city works. Because the reality is that the city legislation is crafted in a committee. And if you were to go back over time, what you would find out is that to my knowledge, I've never seen a committee recommendation uh, turned down. It is, uh, I've never seen an instance of it. And I was informed that that is the way the city operates. Uh, I learned that for a fact, uh, things are done in committee and, and, and they are more or less, it's a done deal. If there is a hearing, I was told, at least in one specific instance, the hearing was irrelevant. The decision had already been, all the work had been done in committee. And subsequent to that, uh, Owen uh, Freeman Daniels uh, raised an issue over the zoning in, on King Street. He wanted to invite all the businessmen to give their inputs. Um, but when it was all done, the person who had headed the committee looking into it said, look, there is no point in doing this. If you touch one thing, all the work of the committee would be for nothing. Therefore, the city council just approved it, the uh, zoning changes, as was. And that, again and again, is the issue. It's why the voters of the city feel left out, because things are done in committee. And you don't get two, vote, uh, two views when it's done in committee. You only get one view. Why is that? Because somebody wants something. So they go into committee. And, they, and they'll lobby for it, and they'll come back again. And if they got money, they'll come back again and again and again until they get what they want. But the average person can't monitor all this stuff. Uh, I actually wrote an article on it. I was shocked to learn that that was how the city operated. I was shocked, and if you haven't had cause to look into it, uh, you'd probably be shocked too. But I wrote an article on it, and I gave it to Mary to distribute to you. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it. but. Um, it was called Open Doors on City Lawmaking, and I uh, outlined in some detail just what that pr procedure is. So then the question was, do you, does this commission have the authority to make that change, to do anything? And when I looked at the uh, charter uh, laws as stipulated, yes, it would be a very simple thing. Um, I think it was on 5.6, uh, the operations of the committees. All that's necessary to do in there is just put in there that when the committees make their recommendations, they include both the pros and the cons. And if, it's, if that's already being done, then it's just redundant to put it in there. But if, as I contend, and in fact as it is, 
it's not being done. The, people, uh, the city councils don't have the time to research everything. They're busy people. It's a part-time job. These subjects can become very complicated and detailed. They do not have time to thoroughly think about them. They mean to do well, but at least in my, from my perspective, very often they're completely blind in how they vote. You guys here, we, you, you guys have the ability to improve this. Not only would it uh, work for here in the city, but it would, I, I believe would set an example. One of the problem at the federal level uh, is that the, uh, it's the same thing. They don't, they don't know what's going on, so they just, they just vote on it. When it comes to form, they don't have the pros and cons. Barry has done a very good part of research. He has, he's, he's documented as to where we're changing the charter. Uh, he's put that recommendation forward as part of the public record that Mary circulated this afternoon. <coughs> Those people who have not read his email, I would suggest you go back and read it. And um, you felt this was a best practice that should be accepted or adopted by the city. Yes. Okay. And uh, Any concluding remarks that you need to catch off, but I just wanted to focus that that documentation is part of the record already. Great, yeah, thanks. And, um, you, you know, that, that is the one side of it. And the other side of it is that there are issues that people just can't touch. And the perfect case of that was the CPA. Um, a third of the, uh, of the electorate voted against it. Yet nobody would dare to come forth and, and argue as to, as to why they would be opposed to the CPA. And that's, that's a problem. It's a problem here. It's a problem on the national level. People uh, with all the mass media, if you speak out on a subject that's unpopular in your district, district you're, you're, you're subject to incredible amounts of pressure. And there needs to be a means to get that information out the other side so that we, uh, whatever your position, you reflect on yourself and you hear the other side. Um, this is the 21st century. We should bring in what we've learned about psychology, human nature, technology. It should go into the... Into the uh, government process, and it's a shame that it, it uh, hasn't happened yet. We look across uh, in the world, we see the problems where they don't talk to each other, or they only hear one side, but the same thing is going on in our government when it comes to, uh, every, a lot of people here might think that, oh, it is very open, but it's open within the same thinking, uh, you, you, uh, but it's not really open to uh, dis disaffected minorities. Thank you for sharing again, Barry, again, I refer you to that email that Mary circulated this afternoon that will be posted as well. I see, um, hi. Hello. I'd like to acknowledge North Street Association and thank them again for taping this. This is up on their website for those folks who want to follow through on this. Do either of you have any comments you want to make at this time? The only other person, Paul, do you have anything you want to say at this particular point in time? I want to close the public comment period and introduce Sorry, I was late. That's okay. Introduce yourself. Thank you, Mark I'm serving at large. Okay. And I recognize someone else who just walked in. Are you here for the public comment portion, or are you here just to listen? This is the vice chair of the school committee. So yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You're in the right room. Come sit down. Relax. Then you're going to be asked questions later. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for not recognizing you. Um, this is a, what we're sort of loosely calling the leadership roundtable, because this came out of an interaction um, that Todd and I had, Todd first raised it, and this came from our first public forum where there were a lot of people on um, both sides of the issue regarding um, powers of the mayor, who should be running city council meetings, school committee meetings. There was a lot of different dialogue going on, and we thought it would be an opportunity for us to spend a little bit of time tonight sort of sorting through some of that because we're going to have to be making the recommendation uh, by January 13th to the full school, uh, to the full city council, and then the city council will take their two-month process, hopefully, to move the process forward to the legislature. So we're in a tight timeline, but we wanted to invite certain folks here who have been in leadership, past mayors, uh, current mayor, the city council presidents, just to kind of interact with us as to what they thought our vice chair, or what do you call the co-chair or vice chair, vice chair, vice chair of the school committee just to get some feedback as to this so we can provide correct direction. We heard a lot of public comment um, in these areas, but we wanted to hear from the people who've actually been in those shoes as to what uh, pluses and minuses they saw from the variety of different options. I want to start with the mayor, the hot topic one, and the mayor running the city council meeting. 
There's been a lot of folks discussing this on a lot of different sides of the issue. And I just wondered if people could begin just a dialogue and we'll sort of, if you raise your hand, we'll call on you and just share your thoughts on that particular issue. Don't all raise your hands. If not, I'll pick on you. Please, Mary, you're the one who actually started this whole conversation, so go I, for I have it. to admit, um, I didn't read all the best practice recommendations or the full report of the last charter committee that recommended there be a charter. Please, for the record, could you introduce yourself uh, just so the camera in case people uh, don't Sorry, know. Mary Ford, and I was mayor from January of 92 uh, through uh, three days of the new millennium. And um, I wondered whether this is the main issue that caused people, I guess mostly members of city council, to say that there needed to be a charter overhaul. So, that, I mean, I, I want to go ahead and address it, mm -hmm. but you, you said it's a hot button thing. I wasn't sure what the major motivation was. When we, when we tried to do the popular process of getting the 12%, 20%, 10% of city voters' signatures on a petition to set up a formal charter overhaul committee. Uh, we failed, but I, I knew what my reasons were for trying to bring that forward. One was simply that the charter is um, not squared away with a lot of the ordinances that have passed. And of course, uh, we still have reference to really old-fashioned language. Uh, gender isn't handled appropriately, and so on. So it was, it was one, the need for sort of modernizing and making sure we didn't have conflicts between things that had grown up as a matter of practice or ordinance changes with what still remained on the charter. The other one was that we had an elected treasurer. I was very concerned when that elected treasurer retired, um, that we didn't have a way, a process in place to appoint a professional treasurer. Now that has been changed since then by one of the small uh, charter amendments, I guess. So, but I am, I am curious, and I think it's really important for the public, when this goes public and it's going to be framed, to understand which are sort of tweaks that you might recommend as part of a comprehensive overhaul, but what is your main goal? Um, so, that so to, to that effect, what is, is your feeling is about, and why don't you share with the people in the room, your feeling about specifically the one topic of should the mayor chair the, school, uh, the, the city council? Um, I basically come down against modifying what's done now, and you may expect that because of having held the mayor's position. But I would say uh, two things. I haven't heard, but maybe they've come to your attention, maybe the current crop of city councilors, or the immediate past crop, uh, feel strongly about this. Um, I haven't heard the sense that the mayor's presence there reduces the power of the city council. Um, and so I would reiterate what I did say a few weeks back. Um, the city council has room to, to hold a thorough debate, almost, although the parliamentary system is so totally different. But when you watch the BBC late at night and you see what happens when members of two parties are debating with the prime minister, all in one room, City Council can have those debates all in the same room with the mayor sitting where you're sitting, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's, there's nothing to prevent that. In, in the rules of, of the council, as well as Robert's rules, the chair is not supposed to be entering into the debate. Uh, and unless somebody's very heavy-handed with the way they implement Robert's rules, um, the council can appoint a parliamentarian to make sure you counterbalance that. I, I haven't heard what the problem is, so that's one. The flip side is, to me, the relative strength of or weakness of the mayor is much more a matter of partially the, the personality and the, and the political judgment calls and so on, 
of incumbents. The same it is for the city councilors. The job is what you make of it. But in this city, realizing that in, in you know, 12 years, 13 have passed um, since I sat in the mayor's seat, uh, the mayor was considered very weak. So the question is, is the motivation to increase council power vis-a-vis -vis the mayor, is it responding just to the changes that were made in the last dozen years, which did strengthen the mayor, giving mayor more direct say in the top echelon of the DPW, for instance, having a more coordinated financial management system reporting to the mayor. Those are both changes done since I left the office. Is it a counter reaction to that strengthening, or is there per some perception about the council being relatively weak, which um, if, as I looked over the charter, um, didn't come from anything in the charter. Okay. Other opinions so on this particular topic? I'll lose my chance, chance to speak. I will give you a chance to speak. As a member of the, of the council, there's another councilor here too, so he would love to have your opinion. I, I don't think this was a hot, a hot topic on the council itself. And my concern here, there's certainly a couple of councilors, but I would say it was a minority. And I'm more concerned that any change be made because of personality or not agreeing with someone who's politically in that office. And that I don't think that it was a kind of reasoned um, approach to changing how we're doing things now. I think it more came from perhaps anger disagreement with the current mayor. And I, I think those same people, like we see now on a national level, the same people calling for term limits, well, once their folks are in, term limits are, oh, we shouldn't have term limits. And so I just hope that if you make this, you, you step back. I, I don't, for me, I don't think it matters one way or the other. I just, um, I think the only reason would be, and I don't know how David feels about this, but I think the mayor has so much to do and is so overwhelmed that it might just be a relief to not have to chair that meeting. Um, but I, for one, do not think, the main thing I want to say is I don't see this. It came up toward the end of the last mayor's term a little bit from one or two councilors. That's my memory of it, and it had much more of a political angle than it did kind of thinking through this through the years I've, I've been on the council. No one, for many years, I have never heard this idea brought up at all uh, for six years, seven years prior to that. Or history, and we, that's where we turn to Steve McGoldrick. There's only one other city talked to who has this form of mayorship, this sort of structure. So it is unique to that banks that we should take a look at it. Is this fit for our venues? He's referred to you, Mr. Murphy. Would you like to comment on anything? Oh, sure. And the topic now is simply that you're working on the mayor now. Just on the mayor and chairing the city council. I don't necessarily have a problem with that. Uh, if it changes, the council president who either has a ward or is an at-large counselor, as, as the president of the council chairing the meeting, as a member of the body, they'll still have their vote, but it does minimize their participation and debate a little bit if they sit in the chair, which would be unfortunate, uh, particularly if they're a ward counselor and part of the, the city didn't quite get represented if it was necessary to do so. So that would be a, that would be a concern. Uh, the, 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 the other place you go, and it's something that I think Phil Dwight put in a note that he distributed to you, when, when the council president starts to run the meetings and perhaps assumes more authority over what goes on the agenda and, and, and that position gets enhanced by that authority, the responsibility of the time also goes up. Uh, it makes it harder for a citizen, full-time employee and city councilor, you know, now it's almost become a part-time job to prep for the meeting. Uh, so you enhance that position. Position is created by the counselors themselves. So how many of the counselors could actually throw their hat in the ring for that position if it enhanced, if it had enhanced responsibilities? Not to say that it shouldn't, but if it did, you, you certainly would have to financially, I think, compensate that individual more if they were elected council president to f take the time to fulfill those responsibilities to give themselves some more support. Um, to do that, and then you find yourself in a situation where you're, you know, you're creating somebody that has more authority than an individual council because of their control of the meeting and the agenda. And if you did run into problems between the mayor and this individual, it, it could make process a lot more difficult. Um, if, if the council president with that authority 
had some disagreements with the mayor on agenda or you know what direction the city's going and do things come up in a timely manner, it, it's potential to become difficult. And again, that would depend a lot on on the council at the time, but it certainly leaves that possibility. Can, can I just jump in here and seek clarification? Does the power lie with chairing the meeting or setting the agenda or a mixture of the two? I, to me, a mixture of the two. Uh, you control the flow of material going on the agenda, and you, you, you control the flow of the meeting, you recognize speakers. We've never had a mayor do that, but it's an extremely powerful thing for a mayor that's heavy handed to control who speaks on any issue, both at the school committee and at the city council. The mayors in my lifetime have not abused that in any way. They've always been quite inclusive, but it certainly, you know, it certainly has that potential. And if that authority is not vested in the mayor, but in a council president, you could have have a potential for an issue with that. Others that would like to speak on this issue. That would be the uh, uh, Claire Higgins, of course, the mayor that brought up this whole topic. I guess. Um, well, the end of my term. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess so. Um, so a couple things, a couple observations. Uh, some of the agenda setting is statutory in nature. You know, only the mayor can set and send um, um, financial transfers, etc., to the council. So that's not a question of the council being able to put finances on the, on the agenda, only the mayor can do that. In our form of government, the mayor has a lot of power financially, but actually relatively little power in terms of land use, right? The, the council really has the land use authority. You know, it has to pass all the zoning. You know, the mayor can appoint uh, planning board members, but the council has to confirm. So the power is really shared and, and, and not it's not evenly spread across various different parts of city government. Um, in the 12 years, or almost 12 years, 11 and three quarters, as I like to say, a five-year-old, that I was a, uh, the mayor, um, we did do some cleaning up of the charter, especially on the financial end. I agreed with Mary that having an, appoint an elected treasurer is not a smart thing for a business that ultimately is a now a $95 million business, and we moved to appoint a treasurer. And we consolidated the finance department. I don't know how many of you know that before we did that, the city collector had to be appointed every year. Mm -hmm. Professional position, the person had to be appointed every year. Um, the assessors were meeting, but it wasn't clear to me that their meetings were in compliance with the open meeting law. Since two of them could drive around in a car together to go visit properties and they would be out of compliance with the open meeting law. <laughs> so we cleaned that all up. There was a whole bunch of stuff we did. Did that enhance the power of the mayor? I don't know. I think it certainly protected the city in a way that it hadn't been protected before. The mayor hires a finance director. Finance director is confirmed by council. Okay, so then you get to the sharing of the, of the council meeting. If you have a president, a city council president that's collaborative with the mayor, then the agenda is set jointly. I met with the last two council presidents on a regular basis to set the agenda. If, a, if you have a council president who's not collaborative with the mayor, then the agenda is not set collaborative. And uh, I had a city council president during my time who very rarely met with me, so the agenda wasn't set collaborative. So really, that's personality driven, and that's something that you may want to look at in terms of how to take the personalities out of it. I don't know if you can. I, I also want to say that I think the mayor has is in a touchy position because the mayor comes to the council to ask for a blessing on programs or, 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 or transfers or whatever that they're looking for, and they obviously have the knowledge that is necessary to put on the table, but they're also the chair in the meeting when people are asking the questions about those things, and there's a fine line between having a debate on the issue versus sharing information, and sometimes the mayor should have the right to debate the, the rightness of his or her cause. You know, they're trying to convince the elected body. So I come down, all things that I've seen, I come down that the mayor should not chair the body because I think it diminishes the legislative role and I think the legislators have to step up. And I think if the mayor was not chairing the body and not pre-digesting some of the information for, for the body, they would have to do more work to understand that. And I think that somewhat gets to Mr. Roth's issue where that, that some things are, in a way, pre-digested. So, and I, 
uh, probably not the best metaphor to use or word to use around supper time, but I, I think that the legislative body really has to act as a legislative body and the chief elected official has to act as the chief elected official in this circumstance. David, would you like to comment on this? Sure, since uh, I'm sort of have a foot in each branch right now. <laughs> and I'm not just in the very nice thing you are, but I'm David Narkowitz. I'm the um, uh, city councilor at large. I'm the city council president. I'm the acting mayor. And I'm the mayor elect. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I, so I'll tell you to start with a story, and that is I so actually Stephen McGoldrick's. Uh, uh, UMass Boston invited all the mayor elects to come to a seminar a couple of Saturdays ago uh, where we met and, and got to sp and got to spend time with four or five really experienced mayors and one of the topics or one of the kind of talking points was okay everybody raise your hand how many of you are going to show up at city council meetings uh, and then the second question was how many of you are going to watch them on TV uh, so it was sort of like this whole thing about like don't go near the city council meetings. Just, just ignore it. Turn it off. So, you know, so it was rather interesting. And of course, I had to keep raising my hand, saying, "Well, actually, I chair the city council." Um, uh, I, I always, when I joined the city council, I found, I found it extremely strange, having worked in the Congress, that the, that the executive was sitting chairing the legislative body. Um, and obviously, I served as a ward councilor and as a city council president. And now I've had the opportunity to be in the chair and chair the meeting. Um, and I, you know, I'm sure that there was a good reason back when it was created back in colonial days, this system. And, uh, but I, I actually come down on the side of there should be a separate legislative body that's, uh, that runs its own function and that the mayor should not chair the city council. Um, and, you know, again, I, part of it is that it just a, on a purely philosophical level, a, se a clearer separation of powers. Um, I also will agree that I do think that um, uh, that this, it, it also I do think the city council has a lot of authority under the charter. The, this whole concept that the mayor is sort of dominates uh, city government, I, I, I vehemently disagree with that. And when I became council president, I spent a lot of time. The first one of the first meetings I had was a workshop to kind of get at this issue of parliament, of the whole parliamentary issue, because. Any ruling of the chair can be overruled by five votes of the city council. So the mayor cannot say you can't speak or this is out of order because it can be, you know, under parliamentary rules, it can be taken to a vote and the body can overrule the chair. So, uh, and again, all mayoral appointments are subject to the confirmation of the council. Um, and and so, you know, I I, I believe that uh, I believe that the mayor. Certainly, should should uh, if a mayor is putting forward, you know, obviously the bringing forward financial orders, I can see the mayor coming to address the body uh, and engaging in that discussion that, that former Mayor Higgins just described. I can also see them coming forward to maybe uh, or to committee hearings or to the council to talk about relevant legislation. Um, in terms of the actual chair issue, because uh, I know this has come up that somehow whoever. Uh, is council president that they will lose some some of their power or authority or voice in the debate? I think as I've looked at most of the modern charters that have been adopted, including East Hampton, their their rules specifically state that the chair not only doesn't lose a vote but can participate in the debate. Um, I don't think you're bound strictly. I, I know there are strict readings of Robert's Rules of Order, but I know the East Hampton Charter says that the chair can participate in debate as well as is a full voting member. Um, so I don't know that that necessarily disqualifies. And again, this whole notion that if because they're chairing that they could somehow do something, again, that the whole body can overrule the ruling of the chair. So, uh, and I think, you know, I've, I've, I've talked with the folks in East Hampton, they have a chair, uh, they have a, a president of the council chairs and then the vice president is there as well in the absence of, uh, of the president. And I haven't heard there being any issues with the way that that's functioned. And the same is true in West Springfield and some of the other more recently created city councils. So that's kind of my position on it. Um, and again, I, it's, uh, I understand that it's a long-standing tradition and there are some advantages to having your entire city government right there in front of you. Um, but uh, I've come to believe that, uh, that having 
a separate legislative body and a separate executive is a, is a, would be a better process ultimately. That's on the city council. <clears throat> Just to update Jim who walked in. Hi, Jim. I apologize for being late, but I was at a Board of Public Works meeting. Yeah, those uh, things yeah. happening at here in seven places. We're talking specifically about who should chair the city council meetings. This is the first, if you will, hot topic with the, should it be the president of the city council or should it be the mayor? David, you want to add something? I just, one other quick piece, and that was just on the whole issue of um, the flip side, though, is what I would just caution members is right now, um, the city council operates with, obviously we're, we're nine people, we have a, a, a very able but still half-time staff person, uh, Mary Madura, who splits her time between the city council and the license commission. I would think that if, if you're contemplating this change, people should also understand that there would, I think there would need to be an increased staffing requirement, um, because this issue of putting together agendas, and, and uh, so I think that's the other piece that you have to keep in mind because I think, what's that, attorney? Potentially, there's, there's you know, we do have a city solicitor, um, but, but still, I think that's the only other thing is sort of the capacity, because right now, it is a, it's viewed as a part-time position that's compensated, uh, you know, $5,000 a year, and there's a half-time staff person. Uh, so that is just one issue I would also make sure that you consider. That Claire? Part. Just in the interest of putting, Spilling out the history on that, when I started, the city clerk was also a clerk to the council and had an enormous amount of work that was done by both the city clerk and the assistant city clerk. And in the interest of changing the workload down there, we took all the city council work out of there and created the city clerk, the council clerk position. We also were looking at how to deal with licenses and um, took that was sort of out there in a way. It was in our central services, which primarily dealt with buildings and grounds. So we took it out of there and put it as the other half of that job. Mary's done an incredibly good job with it before her, Lynn Nuttleman did an incredibly good job with it within the time constraints. But I think there is an increased workload, not just on the council side, but on the license side. We're an entertainment um, um, venue now in a way that we weren't a number of years ago. When, so there is a need, Mary doesn't, incredible amount of legal research just on the license side. So I, I would second Mayor Narkowitz's opinion on, on the need for quality staffing in terms of the council and the agenda setting and the minute re and record keeping, etc. Mr. Gardner. I think I'll stand up this side. <laughs> I'm Pat Goggins and uh, I was uh, council president uh, back in the 90s when Mary Ford was, was mayor. And uh, in anticipation of, uh, of uh, tonight's meeting and understanding that we're going to be discussing this topic, I went back and pulled out my notebook that I had kept uh, from uh, 1972, as I mentioned to you the last time we spoke, um, when I was um, elected, to, along with uh, nine or ten other people, to the uh, Charter Commission. And, and I, uh, the reason I did that was to try to get some sense of what the what the thoughts were at that particular time, and it's it's stunning to me to see uh, to read through that today and to um, notice the similarities in the discussion today, <laughs> and that's 40 years, you know, when we've been talking about this and we've been talking about this, and, and there's been committees and there's been been studies of, of the, this matter and others as they. Uh, affect the charter. Um, this needs to get done. We need to, uh, as a community, bring our charter up to contemporary standards. This is this is one area being discussed tonight that is a, a, an obvious uh, that there's an obvious need for change and to make it, I think, consistent with other uh, uh, communities in the way they approach uh, the um, issue of, of uh, city council meetings. That's what they are. City council meetings They're chaired by the by the. Uh, President of the City Council. That brings with it a number of issues that, that David uh, and Paul have, have touched on and, and that need to be thought through. But there's some precedent for that, and, and, and we don't have to look any further than, than East Hampton to see how, uh, how they have um, a document which is up to contemporary standards and, and addresses a lot of the uh, concerns that have to do with voting responsibilities and the 
what other ways be, be a source of concern um, to those who are going to eventually have to vote on it. But all that being said, uh, we need to keep in mind that we've been spoiled, really, um, despite the fact that it should be corrected, and it's long overdue. We've had a series of, of, of people in the position of mayor who've chaired the city council who have been aware of the importance of that position and have, have not approached it with the idea of, of contentiousness in mind. They have looked at it in a very, they've looked at that responsibility and, and practiced their, their work in a, in a way that uh, reflects what the community really wants, which is, which is to be able to have something that is a smooth running, although uh, out of date way of, of, uh, of running local government. Uh, and I think we, we need to understand that, that under other circumstances, uh, that could have been a very different result. And the community would have long since demanded a change such as is being discussed tonight. Now having said that, I get concerned about what becomes a hot button issue as far as the community is concerned with respect to your recommendations and as far as the council is concerned with respect to those recommendations. I think, I really think, that what needs to come forth from this body is something that does not have a lot of hot buttons attached to it. Something that can give us a home rule charter that allows us to control our own destiny and to solve our problems from within as we go forward. Because we've tweaked it in, in, in certain areas that are obvious and certainly need to be done. But it, as a document, it is flawed and it needs to be corrected. So I would really hope that as you go, as you continue to contemplate your responsibilities here, that you put forward something that inform, uh, conforms to the uh, standards of, of an appropriate home rule charter for a community such as ourselves. It doesn't, at the same time, and this may be somewhat difficult to do, it doesn't cause the kind of problems that are referred to at the last uh, public hearing that we had, it caused the charter in 1973 when it was voted on to lose by eight votes. And that was a personal issue. The same night that we had that public hearing in the other room a few weeks ago, the next topic on the agenda, as you all remember, was, was the city clerk thing. You can see right there, that's what you got going. You know, you have to be careful with those things. But you, the time to deal with the city clerk thing, I think, is, is you know, some language that needs to be put in place with the... Uh, with the adoption of the new uh, the charter recommendation it's going to make that would that would allow the uh, the uh, incumbent in those positions, if you will, to serve out their terms and then and deal with it at, 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 uh, and, and bring the charter, the new charter, into effect, uh, coterminous with the end of uh, of that uh, elected position, if you will. So th these are things I think that need to be done. Um, I hope I don't keep on coming to these meetings for another 40 years <laughs> and talking about this. I'm, we're running out of time. We've really got to do something about this. This is, a, this is a long overdue. Everyone seems to agree and we don't get it done. So I hope we can come up with something. I appreciate that. On that particular topic of chairing of the city council, is there any other comment from this group? Jimmy. <coughs> Please introduce yourself on so the camera. Yes, <coughs> Jim Dostal, former city councilor, former school committee person. Uh, of the city and also a member of the Board of Public Works. Um, my experience goes back all the way to the 50s. Uh, I've served under a lot of mayors working for the city, and I worked with a lot of mayors in the position of uh, chairing the city council. Mm -hmm. uh, I think. I never had a problem with it. And to me, in my experience in looking at it, it's the logical step to have the mayor running that meeting. It's, it's not a disruptive thing. Uh, and the, if, the, if the city council positions were full-time positions where they had the uh, ability and time to research many of the topics that come before the council. I may think differently, but many of these 
positions are filled with people who have full-time jobs and don't have the dedicated time to research the topics, many of them, that come before the council. The mayor has that time because it's a full-time position. And as you can see, uh, and we don't have to go back more than the last 15 or 20 years to see that every mayor that's been in that position has put in at least 60 hours a week. And, and they've done a good job in bringing the topics to the council that the council debates on. So I don't see a real great need for change. And David and I have discussed this, and we're at different ends of the, the spectrum on it, and I know, but uh, I, I don't see a big need for it. Claire, one last comment in this area, and we have to move on to a couple other I think I think the reason why the mayor is the chair of the council is the language in the charter says that the mayor is the chair of any body that he or she sits on. So, sure. um, and I, I think that's important to remember that you should look at each individual role of the mayor and whatever committee separately. So I don't think I agree with Mayor Narkowitz that the mayor shouldn't chair the council. I also don't think the mayor should chair the finance committee, which was, you know, I think the mayor should come to the council's finance committee and have a discussion with them about finances. You know, and the same with economic development. I think it, you have to break it apart now. It's not just chairing the council. There's other committees that the mayor sits on by virtue of the charter or ordinances. That needs to be broken out. And I know you're going to get to the school committee, and I, that's a different discussion. But for those, I think it's important not just to leave it as Oh, the mayor and the chair and the council. There's a whole subset of committees that that affects. One of the other areas that came up last year was the ability to make appointments of the mayor. And uh, the mayor brings one name forward for a yes or down vote on by city council. And that there were certain members of the city council who were looking to have a more active role in those positions. Could we have a few minutes just speaking on that topic? And I'll start with Claire. Let me just start with, for many years, the mayor brought appointments to the city council, and the city council voted them on, on, them on the same night. Right? There wasn't any further vetting. As a part of the reform of the city council that we did in the earlier part of my earlier years in my term, we added a committee on appointment evaluations, and that committee now interviews every um, appointee, which was a step that never existed before. The council rarely doesn't appoint somebody, uh, and that's true, but they have, and I can remember in my time on council not appointing somebody. Um, that uh, So, not re you know, actually what I remember is that the mayor chose not to bring an incumbent forward for reappointment and was pressured by the council, but I believe that's the prerogative of the mayor. The mayor, chief elected officer, is elected by the citizens knowing that they have that, that the appointment authority is there and the, and the mayor has to carry out that part of their job. So I don't think that the mayor should be bringing two or three names forward. I think the mayor should bring names forward, just not to get too grandiose, but just like the president brings names forward. If the legislative body doesn't agree with those people, they vote it down and, and tell the mayor to go back and try again. And that's happened. Not often, but it's happened. Other comments in this area? Well, as, as chair of the appointments committee for the past six years, um, my understanding, we have vetted everyone. We, we do interview people either in committee, which is a public session, or we do phone interviews and we pass that and we then vote and recommend. There have been two instances, uh, let me just back up. I believe, and I wasn't on the council then, when they did the reform, one of the reasons it came about was that there were a few contentious uh, issues around appointments. If, if, correct me if I'm wrong. We're in the very public setting, much more public setting, of a city council meeting. I believe it was the health, uh, might have been the health board. That people, so you could, you could give me that history, but I think that was one reason why they set up an appointments committee. So that somebody who's being appointed didn't then have to, and some people being appointed don't do that well in a much, in a city council meeting with the cameras on, and they're coming forward where the people are, there's a whole council there, and somebody might not want them on the, on the committee. It was a, a, a place where it was um, diff could be difficult for candidates. And in our committee that David also serves on, with just three of us there, 
It's a much more, it's more like, thank you for serving on committees. Because one thing I want you to know, it's become a challenge to get people to serve on, and thank you very much for all of you for serving on this. But it's not like people are knocking down our doors to serve on committees. So what we've tried to do, and in fact, over the years, there have been a couple of candidates who end up pulling their their application, because as they get vetted, and this again, not to be grandiose, but this has happened in, a, in the you know in the in the federal government too, in a presidential appointments, they know that they're going to have a very they might have a contentious time, even if they get through our committee and we might recommend, and they decide you know what, there's probably I'm not going to go through with this, and there were at least two or three that we've done that with, so it's not that every one has a rubber stamp. I think that we've served the function we were meant to serve. So you're comfortable with the process now? I am comfortable with the process. David, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. Um, we should make a distinction between mayoral appointments to get confirmation and elections, because we still have the authority. I think we elect two assessors, and we elect Board of Health members. Yeah. And that, I think don't that... Forget the, don't forget the weighers of the hay. The weighers of hay and all those <laughs> other things. And we, we may want to look at those two together and determine if you want to change that, because I was personally involved in an assessor's election at one point in time that got quite contentious. But that couldn't be controlled in that manner, because uh, somebody could get a, a counselor to say, well, I, I nominate so-and-so as well, and then you stand up and debate before the council and they have an election. So it's two distinct things, and you may want to you may want to try and merge them somehow. And, uh, and would you merge them in the, into the current process that we're doing for, that was described by Paul? Um, I think that I, I would consider merging them all into appointments that are then sent to an appointments and evaluation committee and then voted on by the council as a whole, rather than have that potential for a free-for-all where three councilors nominate three different people and, and you basically have a shootout and an election afterwards, which can, which really doesn't allow you to vet the people. You've got no background. They just come in and say, well, I'd like to do it, and I'm going to start talking about it. It can be quite... Uh... Okay, let's start with Claire, then Mary. I know you want to comment. Well, go ahead. Mary should go ahead. Actually. Mary, go ahead. Um, I, what I'm hearing raises again, I guess, the issue of what is the basic legal structure that's in the Charter, and what are the rules and procedures, which can be either ordinances that any council votes to change, or the rules of the council itself. So I think the charter tried to only lay out who has the authority to nominate and then vote to confirm, and didn't go beyond that. When I was a new mayor, we did actually have an appointments committee. Um, at, at the behest of, of Michael Bartsley, we put together, Maureen Tobin was on it, and one other city councilor, and I took all the, the letters that came into my office asking for seats on different boards and committees and sent it to them and said, you know, I want people who know that um, you can't make your decisions in your neighbor's backyard, you have to do it publicly, and that I'm looking for people who are hardworking and that separately and as a whole body we want balance. You know, I remember stating very clearly the Conservation Commission needs people who understand what it means to try to develop land and other people who understand, you know, muscles, which, you know, as a city councilor or mayor, uh, <laughs> I, I never do. I did understand exactly why and muscles USSD are so important, us. but, you know, that we needed a balance. <laughs> Freshwater muscles. I never do. And, and so it was a process thing. And a lot of what people react to, we liked the way this worked or we didn't, is stuff that you can change by changing the process without changing the, the charter. Right. So uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't modernize the charter, Patrick. But um, it, it's, it does mean, in my mind, I don't see how you can, you can do your job and Pat did it with one of those commissions that everybody in the public voted, you know, the people they thought would be best onto a commission. So it started with voting, not the way you guys are starting the process. And the whole thing was up for grabs, what might be changed. Am I right? Yes. And, and 
but in my view, if you don't also have the ordinance book in front of you, mm -hmm. I don't know how you do the, the, the job. I looked over the old charter and the amendments, and I saw where they started with the mayor having authority over police. And then when fire departments came along, it was like 1850, toward the end of the, uh, of the 19th century, uh, fire departments began to be organized. And they said the council was in charge of that. And then they also said that the council was in charge of all the buildings and grounds. Well, we modernized the fire department as time went on, probably with the help of state and federal regulations and civil service and so on. But um, when I became uh, a city councilor, we still three city councilors had the executive responsibility over buildings of the city. Um, I thought that was really unworkable and brought forth a, a plan as a budgetary measure, measure to add a head of city services or something right. like that. Um, and, um, you know, it, various people agreed. It, we didn't do it as a charter change. Um, you well, look at where the general public might think City Hall has too much power today, some of them are going to say the planning department. The planning department isn't in the charter at all, and and so should it be, and and where the charter talks about um, for cause, you know, council can get rid of a fire chief for for reasonable cause. Do you want to reference modern personnel standards? There was no personnel department uh, when these things were written, and I don't know whether or not you want it in a charter, but to me. It's a critical part of how modern government works. I want to declare, and then I want Steve just to give us the overview of his vision of what a new charter should look like. So, Claire, so just and then quickly, um, there are two, the appointments and evaluations committee was set up when the city council still had evaluation responsibility for assessors, collector, and the auditor. So really now their prime goal, because they don't evaluate those people anymore, they're now part of, of a previous, of a charter change we did maybe six years ago that now puts them under the direction of the finance uh, director. Okay, so now appointments really only does appointments. The city council still does elections for the two positions, the two um, areas that David mentioned, but one of them is subject now to a further charter change. This is the Board of Health, where we had appointed Board of Health members, our elected Board of Health members supervising a full-time city staff person. And that didn't end up being the best thing we could do. And, and also we had a three-person Board of Health as opposed to the more modern five-person Board of Health. So the council, I think, has moved that forward and has sent it off to the legislature to move to a five-member Board of Health appointed by the mayor, subject to confirmation by the council. Same theory that the mayor has the executive authority, is responsible for the departments doing their work, should have the ability to um, have some say in, in how this all works because otherwise you don't have accountability. And this we're talking about public health. We need to have have that. We need to have an accountability chain. So. Uh, David, just one quick point before before you, you close this discussion. That's what you're intending to do. It was pointed out to me uh, back in 1972 again by our consultant that we shouldn't um, consider the city charter as anything very special at all. It was suggested by him that the the, the, the charter, I think I referred to it here at the last uh, last time we spoke as a bastard charter, but that's how he referred to it. And, 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 and the reason he did is because it didn't follow any of the normal uh, patterns for how uh, municipalities would um, act under certain circumstances and what the procedures would be for for governing, and, and as a result, uh, and, and given the fact that and the reason we were elected in 1972 was that it was uh, this is a discussion that was taking place in, uh, throughout the state with many antiquated charters, um, is that so many of them really uh, at that time it was considered the only considered the only way that you could make charter change other than go through a the forming of a charter commission and, and, and revisit the entire matter as a community was legislatively, and that was cumbersome. And, 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 and one, it created a very uh, difficult uh, way to be able to deal with local problems. So 
what we have is a vehicle now to do that differently with a home of charter and, and what I'm really hoping is going to emerge from this. But I, I don't think we have to, as we examine where we are contemporarily in, 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 in government, we need to have a document that is consistent with the way we need to act as a community and with in, in concert with those governing us to adapt to that. And that's what I think we need. Segue very nicely to Steve McGover, who is from the Collins Institute, who is our facilitator for the by the city to help us with the process. Can you just give us a brief overview of what you see the charter is and the problems in our current charter? Well, I mean, the, basically the Commonwealth has, has moved on since 1890 or whatever. The Northampton Charter hasn't had it. It's not caught up with the changes in state law, never mind anything in federal law or whatever. So I think what we need to do is we don't you, you don't clutter a, a charter with descriptions of departments, what departments do what. That's all done by administrative coding, which uh, which which allows the mayor to submit real plans or whatever, and, and then gets voted on by the council. Um, I don't know uh, Mayor Higgins. I, I can't remember is the finance department in special act or an ordinance. Special act. Special act. So but you can't. Special act. It's a special act that does two things. It set up a finance department. But the job descriptions and the descriptions of what the finance department does are in there's job descriptions and then the de de descriptions in ordinance about the specifics. The only other thing it did in there was allow us in by chart in the charter to combine positions, uh, collector, treasurer, finance director. So we don't have to go back to get another special act to do that if, if the city chose to do that. And that's what the, the Board of Health, you mentioned the Board of Health change is going through special act? That's correct. Those are things you want to avoid. You want you want the charter to be flexible enough to be able to do that locally without having to legislate. I agree. So I, agree. I mean, it's provisions in, in modern charters that allow you to organize to, to, yourselves and stay current, that's right. and stay flexible without having to go. Uh -huh. You know, to increase the number of the members of the board of health from three to five, you should not have to legislate. You, you should be able to do that locally. Absolutely. Okay. So, and that and there's, there's provisions in modern charters that allow you to, to, to do that. Right. So I mean, this is not a complicated document. It's basically you know. A, how, how powers are divided up between executive and, and, and legislative. It's got a little bit on the school committee, how the budget's formulated, um, some capital planning stuff, some things on elections. Um, most of the local elections are pretty much governed by state law, but there are certain things you should have in charge so people can, can read it and kind of understand how elections are run locally. And, um, and basically the uh, referendum recall and, and, and initiative petition pieces. It's 10 articles. That, you know, maybe 25 pages at the most. Um, so the layman can actually come to the city hall, go to the library, go online, and understand. You shouldn't have to be a lawyer to understand a child. Um, it, should, it, it should be simple language. And, and, and again, as I said, it's, it, it keep, the, uh, keep as flexible as, as, as possible. Um, so on, on, if you want me to address a couple of topics that came up today, at least, at least my observation on the, uh, on the mayor and on the, uh, the council or whatever, you know, in this country, we love, we love to, to use the word separation of powers. Um, for me, sitting here, as a, not living in North Carolina, there doesn't seem to be a separation of powers here. And if your comments are sort of correct, that the mayor is the only person in the room that actually has the knowledge about everything, and the city councils don't, then what does that mean? You know, who's, where's the balance of power there? Where's the separation of powers? So I, I, I would just kind of like um, throw that out there as to, as to Maybe the city council is going to have to maybe do some more homework rather than mayor coming in with all that you know, supposed knowledge. Because then the mayor can say what the mayor wants to say. So, I mean, we're all, you know, <laughs> we're all human beings. Um, and um, on, the, on the issue of appointments, um, having more than one candidate, you know, presented at, at the same time. If you're a candidate for a, for a full time job, uh, I don't want to be. You know, interviewed in public with two or three other people. I mean, that's not really. I, mean, I, I would probably withdraw. I mean, you don't want to go through that public process because your name is out there, you're in the papers, and you're only looking for a job to be, you know, a professional position. Um, you don't want to be put through that kind of a, a political process. Um, the mayor should, if the mayor does the interview process through the uh, through the HR policies of the city, and comes to a decision of who's the best candidate for the job, that person should be moved forward. Not that person as an alternative. And if, again, if the person's rejected, the mayor goes back to square one and figures out how to fix it. Um, but in my experience, most mayors have the votes before they present a person. Um, 
because you don't want to put that person through that kind of a, uh, a, a, an experience. So, okay. other areas of the yes, office, please? In the cities that have the city council uh, president chairing council meetings, are those city councilors also part time? Are most city councilors part time? All city councilors except for Boston. Except for Boston. Okay, so they somehow know when they take that position that they're going to have that expanded role of meeting to learn the research. And one of the things we pointed out to that salary survey piece was that they're compensated at twice the rate the current city councilors are because they're expected to do a little bit more. So there is a bigger piece. And the part that, that um, was brought up before is that the staffing for the um, city council clerk might need to be expanded and there might be need to be additional staff there to help as well because one of the city councilors might say, I need this research and you know I, I want more information here or I need help with the agenda. So the staffing pattern for that department might need to be altered as well. It's very common practice to have city council presidents have more compensation than that. It's not unusual at all. Jimmy and then Dave. Uh, David, you just mentioned salaries. Did you talk about that already? It came up in the, the previous forum, and um, if you want to add a quick little bit in there, go I would me. like to. Uh, I, you know, I look at the I look at the city council. I look at the school committee, uh, Smith School trustees. They're all underpaid. The mayor is way underpaid, and I think a full study has to be done about that. Okay. But. I don't think a penny, not a penny, should be increased in those salaries until a full-blown study of municipal employees comes about and a way to fund it comes about. We're looking at employees leaving the city now for jobs. We just lost a our water treatment plant operator went for $15,000 a year more than what he's making here in the city. So I, we're in dire need of a study. Our employees have not had raises in two years. And something's got to be done. David, you had your hand up? Yeah, I did speak about the council, and, but I never endorsed one version or another. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd be delighted to have the council president chair the council meetings, okay. provided that there was considerably more compensation there is now and more staff. I mean, we've talked about yeah, those issues, yeah. but I'd be very happy to see the change as long as they were compensated for the extra time, that the staff support was increased and the provisions were there to, to provide for their ability to debate an issue and represent their ward or the city at large in addition to their chair responsibilities, and I'm perfectly fine with it, and I did never say that before. Okay. Uh, just to clarify, as um, would would staffing be part of the charter? Would this be something the council would have to figure out on their own? I think okay. that's, a, that's a council. So issue. this is your issue, right? Okay. <laughs> but but again, and even with the, what should the salaries be in without the charter is another topic issue that will probably be kicked down the road. There might be a mechanism put in there, which is what I think you've described. Tom, is it appropriate to ask some questions? Please. I have, I have a series of questions, but. Uh, the, you indicated, David, that at this conference that you're at, that the mayor said avoid city council. Was that something that was prevalent throughout the state? That the mayor does I, not participate in, in council? No, I think I, I think it was more. Um, I, I think that was a reflection of a, of a robust separation of powers. I guess you know, sort of like uh, you know that, that, that there were some in some communities uh, there was pretty strong debate within the legislative body of probably about the mayor's proposals, budgets, etc. And that the idea was that, you know, just you that, that that you should just let them do their thing, you do your thing, and then the two work out, uh, you know, that, that's the way the process works. Okay. Um, well that that brings me to the next question is there were some for example, there were some they described some mayors that sat through every that just sat in the audience. Uh, uh, a la the 800 pound gorilla in the room at, at city council meetings and that it was again even that
that was viewed as somehow they were influencing the city council or hypnotizing them or doing whatever it was <laughs> by being in the room. Uh, and so there was this whole discussion about that. In different communities, it's viewed differently. But I wasn't meaning to say that the mayor should write off the city council. It was more that no, it, it, they, should, it, they should do their work, you should do your work. I, I understand that. And, and to each of you who participated both as mayors, uh, members of the city council, how do you feel it works in our city and historically over the past 30, 40 years anyway, where it seems that even though there's always the headbutting and the contention, but it really is a collaborative effort on the part of the mayor and the councilors. At least that's the way that it's, that it's appeared. And if we take the mayor off of chairing the city council, do we risk that uh, there is going to be more of a separation of powers and more of uh, inability to work to move things forward. I just wondered if there's a general comment on that. The only thing I would say about that is under a strict interpretation of the current council rules, which again, have sometimes been enforced, sometimes not, the mayor really cannot say anything unless they're asked a question. So. Uh, Mayor in that position is really not. If it if if the rule if, if a council wanted to, they could limit. There could be you know there could be no real discussion. No, the mayor could not comment on any any part of their proposals in that setting. Um, because again, if you read the rules the way they're written now, the mayor can respond to questions, but they're not supposed to engage in the debate. But well, that's the rules. That's not the chart. That's the city council rules. Yeah. But there's nothing in the charter that, that the charter just says the mayor shall chair the meetings. That's all it says. So it's so that's the only part of it is that you know it, it could be right now. I don't. I think there's there's that rule has been interpreted differently, and counselors have availed themselves of the mayor at the meetings and asked questions. But that's it's not. I could see a scenario where that wouldn't happen. I I was about to recognize Bill, but Mary, is this germane to what is in this topic area? Uh, the charter says the mayor shall communicate with the different departments, which was police, fire, and either separate DPW functions, or then after the DPW was brought together, and the same with the council. It doesn't say how. One of the things that, as I look back, that I think has been important to the pretty constructive local governments we've had for 35 years, and I'm aware of it, when there was a faction on the council that tended to oppose the mayor on a lot of stuff, and when there wasn't, we still managed to move things forward. We didn't have a bottleneck, like in Washington, um, and we didn't have that negative attitude that I heard a lot from other mayors. Quite, you know, you're going to do something this way because you think the councilor from Ward 6 would like it, you know, it, that, that just wouldn't come up. The communication when you're sitting in the chair's position is going to you. It's not only from the mayor to the council. So you know that, you know, I don't know, Maria Tomasco is going to be a stickler for the language when she sat on the <coughs> ordinance committee. David's who we're going to turn to if there's um, some issue about assessment because of his, of his profession. I think that this, the strange, odd plan has functioned pretty well, and partly I put that down to the size of the community. When you get a little bit smaller than us, there's still places that run as town government. And you have either an elected, well, at that point, you'd have to have an elected uh, town meeting. But you have in the room together the finance people who are volunteers, along with your professional finance person or town manager or administrator to the select board, and you have the select board, and you have a whole bunch of citizens. And, and in a sense, the legislation gets done uh, not just as a check and balance on the executive, okay? In a bigger form of government, the check and balance makes sense, but I am convinced that you would find, if, if we separate out the way the two bodies function, the executive and the strictly legislative, it's not only the legislative that will need more staffing, it's the executive. 
how, where are you going to find the time to communicate to nine city councilors? And how are you going to communicate and vice versa? Do all the councilors come in to the mayor's office and meet with the mayor once a month or so? Uh, well, you're not, you can't come together. Do you come individually? And in our government, we've managed to work with very few written memos and communities. Basically, the players are a small enough group that, that you, you get a feel for each other. And that's nothing you can put in a charter. But I think it's one of the things that has helped us to work well, just like it has helped all our mayors to be pro-school spending. We, we don't have what a lot of cities do. The mayor's always fighting with the school committee. We don't get that here because we're a small enough group and we communicate. Bill, I want to turn to you. You had your hand up to ask the question. Yeah, uh, I wanted to float a possible compromise on the chair of the, the council question and see if folks here thought it was a workable idea. And Bill Joy touched upon it in his email to us today, and the council member really touched upon it too. Um, so, what if the, count, the city council president holds the gavel, but so that way there is some, it possibly addresses the perception of some that having the mayor hold the gavel creates a, a dynamic that stifles debate. Uh, but to address the issue about setting the agenda, making sure that a full timer uh, has the ability to shape the agenda, you spell out in the charter, things get put on the agenda either by the mayor the city council president, and possibly also a citizen's petition, which we talked about at our last public forum in, the, in our prior meeting, with some bar and signature level, so it doesn't become a total free-for-all, uh, but just that there's some intensity of support out there. That way, in all practicality, the full-timer, the mayor, is probably going to do the bulk of agenda shaping, but it's not closed off to either the city council or the public to say, hey, we have a say in this too. Is that, is that workable, or is that um, only makes sense on paper, but in practice would be a uh, bit convoluted? Comments, Mary? I, you know, I just think um, you need some clear lines, and, and you can't depend on people getting along with each other necessarily. You know, so I think it's clearer if the legislative body acts as the legislative body, and the executive branch acts as the executive branch. I hear what Mayor is saying, and quite frankly, if I was running for office uh, for re-election as mayor, which thank God I didn't do, it's for for a person to be the mayor over time that they get to know the people in the city get to know them really well through the chairing of the council. They're on TV a lot, and they won't be on TV quite as much. So it's kind of an interesting dilemma for the mayor, right? But I don't think I. I, I you know, you're, we haven't had this, but you know, there are other cities where the city council and the mayor cross the street when they see each other. What do you do if you have that circumstance? I don't think you can have a, 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 a place where you, the mayor delegates the appointment authority to a, a group of councilors. What if the mayor and the council are at the You have to build it to be able to deal with those politi the political factions if, if they arise. You know, we think we're the happy valley and we're all going to get along, but you know, there have been there have been times on our council where there were a lot of five four votes, not in the last number of years, but in, in previous years. Two decades ago, yeah. very very. You know, Red, you remember those sure. times. And so you can't build it where it depends on the people feeling okay about each other. I guess, and, and that seems, you know, sad to say, but I think it's true. On our Dave Murphy, then I also want to start moving on here. Just quickly, I think the responsibility for agenda has to fall on an individual, ultimately. Um, I, it shouldn't really be from anything. It's the mayor's responsibility. It's the council president's response. Somebody has to be ultimately responsible. The one thing that we were talking about a moment ago I'd like to comment on is I I think the charter should specify that the, if the, even if the mayor doesn't chair the meeting, that the mayor attends the meeting as a resource. Right now, it's our policy to have the finance director attend as a resource. So if in debate you need clarification, uh, you can get it from the finance director. I think the mayor should be in the room. First of all, you don't want you don't want a mayor to be in a position where they can avoid the council meeting if, in fact, uh, it is their budget or it's something that they, they're they needed for. I don't want it to be possible for them to go to Tahiti and just avoid it altogether. They should have to be there. 
not chairing the meeting, but as a resource to the council for, for answering questions and for advocating if they need to for their position. So I wouldn't want them to be able to avoid coming. I think that you know this, this provision now that we have written, the, the mayor is never precluded from recommending measures of the council. I mean, it's just I hereby recommend the passage of the company ordinance, and then and that and the ordinance is written by the mayor's office because of the resource issue. That's very real. But you know, if the mayor should have to, if the mayor's proposing an ordinance, and the mayor wants that ordinance passed, the mayor's going to show up and advocate that ordinance. But if it's a communication from the mayor on some you know sundry issue. The mayor shouldn't have to come to the meeting because they're sharing a communication that's, that's, that's just, just uh, ministerial. Um, but I, I understand your point, but I think the mayor should, the mayor should, the mayor's going to be required to come when they're proposing the budget and they're proposing the, uh, a certain measure. Because why would they not if they're advocating for the past year without the public ordinance? But if they're proposing, let's recognize National Park Month. Right. I mean, if it's, if it's, it's one of those types of you know, resolution type things or something like that, you know, I, I don't think the mayor should be required Claire, to I'll take one final comment and then we'll get a move In on. terms of the agenda setting, the mayor has to be able to get their items on the, on the agenda. There can't be a, a veto of a council president on, on an item. And I know there are some communities where, you know, the mayor, the mayor might send something, but it doesn't necessarily make it on the agenda. Oh, the mayor might come to the meeting and that would be recognized to speak. It has to be, <laughs> you, know? you have to build in the, the mayor, whatever the mayor. Like that is in your proposal. There yes. are some time-sensitive okay. things that need to be dealt with. Correct. If, if people Correct. can ignore them, then you really yeah. can get into a problem. And the problem. template that we've been working off of, that does exist. So I just want to make sure okay. that it's out there. A piece of it. Um, I want to flip now. I, I just would like to David, say I'm going to be opposed to compulsory attendance. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, <laughs> I would like to now turn to school committee. And there are several people in the room who have also participated on, on that issue as well. And um, should the mayor chair the school committee? Should the mayor actually now has a vote on the school committee? That's different than the city council. The 10th vote, by the way. The 10th vote. The mayor doesn't have a vote in the city council, but in our unique system, it not only chairs the, the school committee, but has a vote on the school committee. Claire. But just in terms of history, and Steve, you should weigh in here, but I think that's true in a lot of communities, that the mayor has a vote on the school committee. That happened after Proposition 2 and a half passed. That was in order to put the mayor in the mix on decisions that the school committee was making in a different way. And so because school costs were so much driving the cost of city and budgets. And on the, you know, in towns, it plays out a little differently, but the town manager has some role in terms of negotiations on the yeah, With schools. the superintendent. Yeah, so just it, it's not unique to us that the mayor has a vote on the, on the school committee. I just want to make that point. That's very common. Not it's I, very, very common. But not, as, not, not, as the, not as even, not as the person of the that constitutes an even number. A lot of Western Massachusetts, um, right in, in the late 80s, put the mayor on the school committee by special act, but didn't decrease the membership of the existing school committee. So there's a, there's a situation on the Northampton school committee where you could have a tie vote. And that has happened. Mary, ever? Condoms, Mary? <laughs> that was a male-female breakdown, but if men yeah, voted but against it, women voted for it. But the women won. <laughs> yeah, and the women won. It was a gender-line vote. And the yes, it was. <laughs> It was a gender line vote. Now, do you want to add anything at this point? Well, I would just say I agree because I made phone calls to different cities. Oh. I can't remember which ones they are. I don't have it in front of me. But I made phone calls to Greenfield, uh, Holyoke, West Springfield, and they, they did the mayor chair this document and voted. Awesome. Yeah. And that's, we have a document to support that as well. So um, not only chairs, but votes. The school committee. So I just wanted to put you on the spot as the only one for the school committee at the moment. I'll be talking to the rest okay. about that. Um, I actually do not think that the mayor should be chairing the school committee, and um, especially because we have a 10 member board, I, I don't see why the mayor is voting on the school committee. Um, I've been on the school committee for 10 years, three years as vice chair, and this is not a commentary on the specific mayor I've worked with because Claire was a, a fabulous member of the board. Um, 
and the mayor brings a resource to the board that we don't have in terms of what's going on with the city budget, what's going on um, with city contract negotiations, which, which um, impacts how we do our work as well. Um, it, we, and we, have, we set our agendas uh, between the, the superintendent, the mayor, and the vice chair, or the chair and the vice chair. Um, no one, it's always done in conjunction, no one person sets the agenda. Um, and to me, the only downside of not having the mayor chair, as what David Murphy said about the city council, is that the chair is then an elected member who has a much more difficult time participating in the discussion. Um, it's, very, it's very hard to participate and run a meeting at the same time. And it's, um, I think it's written in our, in our bylaws, actually, in our school committee bylaws, that um, the chair has to pass the gavel over to the next person in order to participate in discussion, which we don't really follow up with. Um, if we'd be passing the gavel back and forth all the time, like I said, we'd so free from this discussion. Um, but we, um, our, the most of our information is really gathered through the superintendent. Um, and we rely on, we hire the superintendent that we, that we wanted, and we rely on that person to bring us um, good and, and um, uh, right information about whatever topics that we need to discuss. Um, and I, I really see the mayor as, the mayor's role as a, um, as a resource, the way you were talking earlier about um, city council, but not as necessarily, you know, we've, I, I was fortunate to serve under a mayor who was really very interested in education and knew a lot about education uh, reform law and all the rest of it, but, a mayor isn't necessarily leaning that way. Now, I don't know that Northampton is going to hire a mayor that's not interested in education, but it could, it could happen. Um, we shouldn't be writing a charter based on the individual people we might elect. It should be written in a generic, for a generic person. Um, and that's not necessarily somebody who has an interest or knowledge about education. Um, so I'm, I haven't understood why that role has been the chair or a voting member. We also just need, uh, we don't know who you now, but if you can announce your name and... and I'm Stephanie Peck, and and our and vice chair of the school committee. Thank you, just so it gets into the Northern Association. The, the other thing that I wanted to say is just, I, I found it really interesting for my years in the school committee. How many people come to me and say, you know, that the mayor really runs the meeting and, and decides how everything's going to go. And I think the mayor's only been one vote out of ten. And if that's really your perception of the school committee members, then you need to do something different about who you're electing to be on the school committee. Because we are meant to be assertive people in bringing our own um, um, thoughts about whatever we're voting on to the table. We shouldn't be um, railroaded by a mayor, and I have not felt that that's what's happened. But there does seem to be some perception that, there, that the mayor has more authority than is really written into um, the charter or the bylaws or anything else about the school committee. Jimmy, I saw your hand, and then to Claire, and then to Pat. Yeah, I, I served uh, the school committee under both scenarios, where mm -hmm. the vice chair, who was Chuck Johnson, served as chair of the committee. And uh, uh, I think it works perfectly well that way. Uh, we've been very, very fortunate in Northampton to have, uh, for the last at least two elections, uh, or three elections, voted in school-oriented mayors, people that were definitely concerned with education. Uh, but I see, I, I don't see them as necessarily having to be the chair of the committee. I think the school committee has done a yeoman's job on electing people who are definitely pro-education and they're not politicians. So, Claire, I believe you're the next one. Yeah, and this is where I'm going to disagree with my opinion on this city council. I think the city council, the school committee plays a different role. Than, than Can you speak up just a little bit? So it's school committee is a different role. And the school, we spend about 60, a little over 60 percent of, probably about 60 percent of the budget here in the city on schools. And I think the mayor has to be very active and engaged in these schools. It's a significant part of the budget. It's a significant, important thing that cities and towns do is educate kids. And 
the school committee members are elected to manage the schools, I think the mayor brings another perspective to the table that's very important. And I would worry that that, that would be diminished if the mayor didn't share. Now, I, you know, I, I, I don't think you can mandate, you know, that the mayor be engaged in education. I think that's true, Stephanie. But I do think that anybody who's elected in the city of Northampton is going to be engaged. So, I just worry that if you sideline the sideline the role of mayor, and I think if you look at Greenfield's earliest, I think they they didn't have the mayor chairing, and the mayor had some significant issues. Actually, there was some real battles on the school committee. So, and I think now the mayor chair. I can't remember the whole story up there, but I worry about sidelining the mayor in there in that whole thing. I don't really worry about the tie issue. I really don't. I think ten is. You know, I don't think that's going to come up that often. Uh, well, I have a. Just a suggestion, or, or it's somewhat consistent with the position I've, I've had for some time. Um, and I think that the I think the school committee should be uh, the meeting should be chaired by the by the uh, vice chairman, not the by the uh, a member of the body, not by the mayor. Uh, but I think that as you revisit how that might best work and work out language to reflect that, I think it's important that uh, it be taken into consideration that Ed Reform had a very different idea of how school superintendents act in their position in relation to the school committee than is the practice here in Northampton. No reflection on those who are in office now, or, nor have been since the early 90s when Ed Reform was passed. But if you go back to 1980 when, when Proposition 2 and a half was passed, the reason that more of, of school committees started to have mayor's involvement on the, on the on, the, on those bodies was because prior to that they had autonomy, the school committees, and they were able to run their own budget, if you will, and the city had to let, let the chips fall where they may. And the consequence of that was much of the impetus that led to the, to the passage of two and a half in the first place, for those of you who can remember back in those olden days. Well, we're, we have it now. It's in place, and it's, and it's there for us to be able to work within. In addition to that, we have Ed Reform which passed during the period of time that I was on the city council. And I had a very different impression of what Ed Reform was intended to do than what, in practice, has been the case in Northampton. And without mentioning any names, I will suggest to you that the reason that that, that practice has, has been involved is because at the time it was passed, we had what I would consider a weak superintendent from a leadership standpoint. But we had a strong vice chairman of the school committee who had had significant power and responsibility, and who continued to practice his way the same under Red Reform as he did as he did prior to that. Good man, great man, did a lot of good for the city, but nothing changed. But something has changed. We just never recognized it as a community. We need a strong superintendent. That is what every form calls for, and we have danced around that and face the consequences of it with the revolving door that has existed in that, in that department for many years. Now, I don't mean this in a critical way. I'm pointing it out simply as an observer. I've spoken to the school committee in their public session about this, and <laughs> nothing happened. But not that I expected that it would. But if, 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 we're, if we're going to look at something in the, in the context of contemporary times, part of that contemporary um, observation should be making whatever recommendations you, you intend to make consistent with, with, with the laws, if you will, that are in practice today. And I believe that we've missed the boat on that. In so the school just to summarize real quickly to make sure I understood what you said, you do feel that the vice chair should be chairing the meeting? Yes, but not, not the mayor. Not should the mayor be a voting members, member? In every form. Should the mayor be a voting member of the school committee? I'm not so sure on that one way or another. I don't have a strong feeling on that. Okay, Claire, I see your hand again. I just want to make two observations to my friend Patrick. One is um, the tenure of our superintendents has been about the average of superintendents across the Commonwealth, so we have not had a revolving door any more than anybody else has. So, Maybe I just see the right. Well, as we get older, time collapses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so that, that's one issue. Uh, the second thing is that um, uh, this new school committee, I give a lot of credit for it, has been doing some self-study around um, the way school committees should, com should um, conduct their work. Um, and look, has been using um, uh, as a template um, 
uh, an essential school board book. So, and has really been looking at well, how school committees should be conducting their business. <coughs> so, and, and I also think they've identified a superintendent who is very well versed in ed reform and also have hired an attorney who has worked to correct labor contracts that were not in compliance with ed reform. So it's taken a long time, but I think the school committee... 20 years. Well, yeah, I know. But I think the school committee is on track to do that. Good. And so, that, so that's one issue. And the second issue is, I, I don't have to beat a, a dead horse here about the chairing of the, of the meeting, but you, you observe that we had a person who was a strong vice chair and didn't want to let go of power. The reason I think that the, elected, the chief elected official of the city make, it's, makes sense is because people, no matter what happens, whether they're the chair or not the chair, whether they don't even show up at the meeting, they are held, the mayor is held responsible for the performance of the school. Bottom line, the mayor is held responsible. But every form gives the responsibility for the performance of the but, schools to the superintendent. But if you your kid is not doing well, that you don't really care about that, you call the mayor. Mm -hmm. that, that just, well, that's because if the MCAT scores go down, he gets blamed. I'm going to look at speed. Do you think that's true across the country? Yes, because I think the, because <laughs> schools have so much you know, to do with the quality of life of any community, right. and property values, and everything else. And if you have a, if you have a bad school system, People just tend to point the finger at the person most accountable, mm -hmm. and it's the person who has been elected citywide and has the most, you know, uh, exposure. And that's, and that's why, just what that's just what. And that's why big call city, in, you know? as big city, in many of the big cities, as with failing school systems, they've gone to a mayoral appointed school committee in order to try to right the ship. Now, I'm not saying that we have that problem here, but I'll tell you, I got a lot of calls about the schools, and I would redirect them back to the superintendent. Well, okay. I, I think it's, I think it's something that is in place and needs to be looked at, and I don't think it's uh, mm -hmm. something that is uh, out of context with the analysis that you're making overall. Mm -hmm. I note that Mary Ford is strangely quiet on this subject. Would you like to <laughs> add anything? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. But no, I think I understood what people have expressed, and uh, I don't I don't have a real strong feeling. Can, can I just get clarification on, on um, Patrick's comment about the role of the superintendent? Does, are, you, are you saying that the mayor's presence overshadows the superintendent? I, I, I've just observed the previous superintendent in, in the interaction between the mayor and her at meetings, and it was never clear what her role was at those meetings, what her role is in education. Um, her being the Who mayor or the, or the superintendent? I'm sorry, the previous superintendent. Well, my, my, my point of view was that it, it should be absolutely clear, uh, and it should be the superintendent. And I think that the mayor's role, as clear as described, is something that I see as a, is an important now more than I thought about it. But, but I think if you look at that reform, it's absolutely crystal clear where that responsibility should be. And I think we have missed the boat. So you're saying we need clear lines of accountability for the superintendent and the yes. mayor. If the mayor is over-involved in that committee, then it starts to muddy lines of accountability. I think it's inconsistent with the law. Okay. The superintendent does set the agenda with, with the chair Captain. vice chair. Yep. Stephanie, uh, anything else you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, it is that not my experience my that constituents who speak to me hold the mayor accountable when there's something wrong with the schools. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to dispute that the mayor's office doesn't get lots of phone calls. The superintendent's office gets a right. lot of phone calls, too. And when people are, are upset about something that's going on in the schools, concerned, um, the person I direct them to is not the mayor, but is the superintendent, because it's the right place to send it. And people will talk to me about how well or not well they perceive the, the superintendent doing in their role for schools. It's not, not ever about the mayor in, in, um, in, in general at all. And to me, that's the way it should be. Um, the superintendent is hired to manage the school system. What checks and balances would be on, again, as, as a person, one of the few people in this room who doesn't have kids in the school system, worried about that 1980 when schools got, I don't want to say out of control because that's not fair, but the school budgets expanded more than city tax rolls could pay for. And we led to the backlash with Proposition 2 and a half. And how, when we take the CEO of the town, the city, out of 
any role in the school committee. How do we, as a citizenry, recognize that there's a check and a balance there? How do we, how do we set up safeguards that the school committee, when I look at regional school systems, um, you see lots of fights between the regional school committee and the, the local towns. And, you know, they'll set a budget and the towns won't accept it. It goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I'm almost thinking that's what's going to happen here if the mayor isn't an active member of that. How, help me get past that fear. I hope I didn't imply that I didn't think the mayor should have an active role in the school Okay. Um, I do think that the mayor should be attending school committee meetings um, and be a member of uh, and the whole voting, non-voting thing. I don't feel nearly as strongly about that. I, I, I really can go either way with that. Um, as, as Claire said, our budget is a huge percentage of the city budget. Um, and we rely on the mayor's information about the city budget for a lot of our deliberations. Um, in terms of checks and balances, it's, it's not a, like a town meeting where we go and ask for a budget and we get um, approved or declined. We're, we're told how much we're going to get um, in, in appropriation money, and we have to work with that number. We can, and we have, um, gone to the mayor and said we need more and been told no, and then there are times when the mayor and the city council have been very generous and they've said, yes, we're going to make up for this loss, or as they, as they have recently for us. Um, is, I think it's very helpful to have the mayor on the board and serving as the liaison between the two, the two big boards in the, in the town, the school, the school board and the um, city council. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what more you're looking for in terms of job right, balance. So, so we're given an appropriation now, and, and then we also have all of our grant funding, and so that our superintendent and our business manager work very closely um, and bring those numbers to us, and then it's for the school committee to deliberate with their um, input about what our priorities are. And, and um, we can't spend more, we don't spend more than we're given. We have to spend right. it with a balanced budget. And you're heavily regulated by Ed Reform and the rest. Oh. So, yeah, so it's, it's I, I just wanted you to make those points for yeah. the record. And I'll, I'll just say, as, you know, as my, my personal um, um, beef with the way budgets and government works is that we are not told from the state and federal government how much we are necessarily going to receive for a given school year before we have to put in our budget. It makes it very difficult <laughs> understating that. Other comments in this area or other questions from the committee? Um, if if the mayor retained a, a voting role, whether chair or not, would it be a big deal if there was, if there was one less at-large member? Uh, I know, understand that the tie vote issue may not be that pressing, but I also have a concern about contested competitive elections. And right now, we get in ten the years day. we've never had any vote come close to. Well, but then there's a secondary concern, which is a lot of school committee elections are not competitive. And just for example, we had two people showed up for two slots and at large, and they both hit on. Uh, that's, that's disappointing. Right. Uh, and that seems to be a trend in a lot of these positions that just people don't volunteer for these types of roles as much as they used to because of changes in people's, you know, work and lifestyles. So if there was one less at-large member, um, would, would the school committee care? Would it be a big deal? Would it cause a backlash? Would it be a, a secret landmine that could sink the whole charter or just be a shrug and everyone would move on? Um, I do actually think it's important. When um, particular topics come up, um, um, constituents will write to the, or email or call their board members and their at-large members in general. Sometimes they'll write to the, the entire board, but not always. And if you only have one at-large as opposed to two, you're only, depending on what their own personal priorities are or, or what their perceived constituents, you know, what, their, what they perceive their constituency to think is important, um, we may not get all the information that we would get from two people who may have very different opinions about things. Um, in, in, in a city our size, I think to have one at-large member is diminishing the role. If I could follow up on that, one of the thoughts that I had after we had this conversation was um, committees that you have to serve on, the subcommittees that the school committee has to serve on, you would then have 10% less people, one less person, to be able to serve on these subcommittees. How much of an impact would that be? You know, in, in terms of increasing. Two, two yeah. perspectives. One is we have reduced the roles of our subcommittees recently, based on, as Claire was saying, that we have to change the um, 
some of the parameters for how we work. Um, so some of our subcommittees are meeting less often. However, we have a lot of ad hoc committees, and we are we are wanted at um, city council meetings, at SPEDPAC meetings, at um, NEF meetings. We have a representative on the HEC, uh, I'm sorry, on the collaborative board. Um, we're wanted all over the place, and most of us work full time. So it, one less person makes a big difference. Uh, I thought David Pan's president made clear. It's just it goes on and on as it does for city council. The number of committees we have. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I, I was just going to. Uh, I, I, as a counselor, was not very closely involved with the school committee. Didn't follow it very much, other than just you know, our once a year we have a joint meeting. Um, my observations, having now chaired four or five uh, school committee meetings. Um, and again, I, I, my, my observation is I think it's a very strong, very active school committee that has done a lot of self-reform, done a lot of work. I, I've been talking about a consent agenda at the city council for a long time, and they just did it, and it's working really well uh, in terms of moving along their meeting and dealing with sort of administrative matters much quicker and making the meeting shorter. Um, and I also, uh, I haven't worked with other superintendents, but I feel like the superintendent is a very strong, dynamic uh, leader. Um, and so I actually feel, uh, and also I, I'm a member of the school committee, unlike my role chairing the city council, I'm not a member of the city council. Um, I'm sort of this outside person that's imposed on them to chair. Uh, in the city, in the school committee format, I'm a member of the school committee. So, um, and what, but what I've actually observed is I feel like I can sort of pull back and not impose myself, to let the, the school committee kind of have a really full debate amongst itself and talk about issues. As the chair, I'm there sort of facilitating that discussion. So I actually kind of feel the opposite effect of when I'm chairing the city council where, um, where people are looking at me and, and, uh, and a lot of these issues are issues that I've proposed or that I've put forward as opposed to on the school committee where they're discussing policy, curriculum, and, and budgetary matters and things like that that are within the school department. So it's a little different. Di I just would want to describe to you that it's a different dynamic and that actually, um, you know, I think the one of the intents of having this uh, non-member chair the, the city council and the mayor may have been to allow them to sort of have all that discussion and have this non-voting member. Of course, it hasn't really worked out, at least in perception, it hasn't worked out that way. And just because of the inherent tension between the, the mayor and the uh, city council, it just it doesn't work out. I do think on the school committee side, um, I actually think it's, it, it's a, it's a, it actually works well from what I've observed. Now, obviously, we haven't, I haven't been through budget season or anything like that yet. But that would just be my observation. I don't have a lot of long history with all the ed reform and various superintendents. Then the only other issue that came up, because um, I at this mayor's conference, there were mayors that came from communities where they were the chair, and there were, there were communities where they were just members. Um, and there was an issue about, well, if they're, if they're a sort of a rank and file member, do they serve on subcommittees? Are they then, a, is the mayor then expected to serve on subcommittees and then, um, <coughs> Just knowing the time constraints of the mayor and all that, that's just one issue you'd want to think about. Um, so anyway, those are just, uh, again, I don't have as long of a history as, as Mayors Ford and, and Higgins on this one, but that's just my observation. Okay, you about that? <clears throat> just quickly, I think that one of the biggest problems that we're having for education is the, that, that cities and towns are feeling less and less able to fund it. And so they're increasing tension the city and the school sides of the government. And I think a way to build the bridge is to have the mayor as actively engaged as possible on the school side. And that's what, and it's independent of who the chair is. I think it's really important to have the mayor invested in the outcome on the schools. And that helps bridge that. And I think if you look at town government where they don't have the ability to do that, or if you look at regional schools where they don't have the ability to do that, the tension can tend to be higher. So I, I'm, I'm advocating because I think it, for this, because I think it, you know, Mary interesting was arguing that on the city side, I'm arguing it more for the school side, and, you know, that, that there's an important bridge that has to be built between the city side of government and the school side of government. 
And the other thing is that I think, and, and I, I, I think it's really important for the schools not to be uh, uh, an, an island unto themselves in city government. And if the mayor isn't there, I think there's a way, or even is not playing a fairly prominent role, that they can balkanize themselves and recreate their own building and grounds, their own, their own HR, their own this, their own that, where you have duplication of effort that you don't need. And we should be spending as much of each education dollar directly in the classroom as we possibly can. And that's another role the mayor can play, making city departments play well with the school department. Can you just repeat that last sentence? Seriously. Well, that, that it's the mayor's role to have city departments play well with the school department. Can we comment on that? If the mayor didn't have, would, could you see a scenario 10 years down the line? Because again, this charter could be for 100 years. Um, I, I, I think it's very important for the school side and the city side to work more collaboratively together than we actually have in, in the past. And that's not about the mayor's role, that's that we don't have a lot of interaction with city council. We have one meeting a year at a time when it's, it's after we've formulated our budget for the most part. It's kind of after the fact. Um, but I also am wary of um, creating a scenario where the superintendent and the school department don't have the authority that they need to have to run the school system well. It's been really important in this fiscal environment for us to work collaboratively and to, and to collapse some positions. I think um, um, doing that in HR has been um, very economically wise. Um, I don't think that we should be running you know, um, make grounds and maintenance separately. And there are certain places where it certainly makes sense for the city and the school committee to um, be working together. Um, exactly for the reason that Claire said, because every dollar that can go toward education for the, for the children and to supporting our staff and administrators is, should, should be there. Um, but anything that is directly education related, I think that, that the school department needs to have autonomy over, over those. And I don't think Claire would I agree with that. I just want to make sure that that's clear. I agree with that. But uh, what I'm saying is all the other, you know, the, the bookkeeping and the HR and all those things that are support services that we offer to every single other department, why aren't, you know, why don't we? We shouldn't make education pay for those twice, right? And we shouldn't make the taxpayers pay for them twice. Any other areas in, in this particular area? Well, one other area we're going to talk about, and this will be a fun one. Oh, good. Life is terms, term limits, yeah. and I'm going to throw in there recall. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I have one last comment here? Please. Just a question on the school committee too, though. If uh, I see why the mayor wants to get engaged, should be engaged, with a big role there. But I still wasn't quite sure about the, the last point. If the mayor is not going to be uh, serving on subcommittees, is going to be just an extra tenth vote. Why not just have the mayor show up, you know, on, on occasion? to make sure that the activities of the school board are consistent and the schools are consistent taking advantage of the services and resources available in the rest of the city. Can't the mayor still be engaged? As the mayor, you know, I, you know Mayor Higgins, you were interested, very involved in, in educational issues, but if future mayors, if, you know, Mayor Nardowitz and future mayors, if they don't share that, if they, they don't have the resources, they don't have the time for that, should they be obliged to show up at every meeting? Couldn't the chair just continue to be the vice chair or even the superintendent? Are you asking me specifically? Stephanie, you want to take it, and then Mary, you can respond. First of all, if a um, mayor in Northampton doesn't have real interest in schools, they're not going to be elected. Because that's just not going to fly in this community. But it, it, but make I, it a I hear, balance of the time versus the interest. I, I do think that the mayor should be there um, as, the, as an active member. That doesn't necessarily mean voting. I, as I said, I don't feel as strongly about that. But as an active member, specifically because we are such a big part of the budget to serve as an active liaison between the two boards because there is never a meeting where we're not discussing finances um, when we're not concerned if you know um, you know often we're, we're in meetings or executive session discussing um, contract negotiations um, I think it's been really important this year um, in terms of bringing the city together that our that the way we um, approach negotiations has is a has a more citywide feel to it. Um, 
certainly on the school <coughs> side, we've, we've in the past done six separate negotiations with our different unions. We didn't do that this year. For the first time, we did a collaborative um, negotiation with all six unions. And, um, and regardless of how people feel about the results, and that worked very well. It was very efficient. And it helps the different the people in the different unions um, see what the, what, the, what the roles of their colleagues are. And I think it's important for the mayor to be able to share with us what's what's going on in, in union negotiations across the city so that we're not operating in a vacuum. We're not we're not a big enough city to be that we should be operating in a vacuum on city on school side. Um, so I think that's that's I think it would really diminish the role of the mayor to not be an active participant in this on school committee. Mayor? I, I would not want to see that happen. Any quick comments here, Virginia? Yeah, well, um, I, what I, what I thought in response to Mark's query was a slightly different thing, and it's really not a charter issue, but as the prime spokesperson for the city, um, you're not only the, the, the single leader that a lot of questions come to internally, you're the chief lobbyist. And a lot of these discussions um, are matters not just of law, but of the incredible financial tightness that we've faced ever since uh, 1980. Uh, and so each of the, in, the three mayoral administrations that I know of had to function with uh, year after year more tightness than almost any other town. And I'm not going to go into the whole, you know, the every form formula and why it hurt us even worse than Prop Two and a Half did, but it, it it did. And you won't find a single municipality, I don't think that spends every dollar more carefully than we do and gets really high quality results. And that does go through every single department. And the mayor helps to represent that when meeting with the school committee. And then conversely, when the mayor goes to Boston, whether it's to meet with other mayors or uh, the chief education officer or the governor, um, all, I know that Dave Musani and Claire and I all felt, although Dave was not as active during the school committee, we all knew the school's needs well enough to be able to <coughs> lobby across all the departments. Um, you have to know about the highway funding needs. You learn enough about that program so you can say, yeah, we want the Chapter 80 money to go up. But we also um, <laughs> knew what was... Uh, or was it 90? Chapter 81 and Chapter 90. And, 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 and um, it's important, I think, for Steve to understand there is no staffing that you would think of in the mayor's office. We have a wonderful office manager assistant who handles a huge amount of issues of flow and sometimes of content, but can't leave the office. And there is not now, I, I don't think, and, and there wasn't during most of Claire's time, and only for, for part of my years, somebody who could be a, a, a second in command um, to help, for instance, write an ordinance. So when you, when you speak of a motion coming to the agenda from the mayor's office, it's either the mayor, him or herself, well, that's really or too. the head planner, or uh, occasionally the attorney. I so, I'm sorry, that's, that's going off a little bit, but you understand. I felt that it was incredibly important for me in municipal circles to always be conscious of the school funding needs. And if I hadn't sat there week after week, I, I couldn't have done that as well. I, Claire and Patrick, and then we could have moved on. I'm just going to, quick thing. When, Mary, when I was city council president, Mary was mayor. We wanted to do full day kindergarten in the city. Mary really, I understood it from a professional point of view. Yeah. Mary understood it because she'd been on the city council. We were able to go to Boston and make a case and get special funding to get full day kindergarten. If Mary hadn't been sitting in those meetings and understanding how that played in with uh, increasing charter school enrollments because they offered full day kindergarten, we only offered half day kindergarten, et cetera, et cetera, it would have been difficult. 
Second thing is, city finances and school finances now are incredibly intertwined. Before, and, and that's happened since Ed Reform, with a net school spending minimum that you really have to understand that's tied into uh, what different, uh, different areas of revenue growth coupled with um, the foundation budget. I, I, you would you know, slip into a coma if I actually started talking about this. But, um, <laughs> It, the, the chief elected official has to understand and it has to be able to talk about it articulately when they go to, go to lobby for well, lobby on behalf of, of the city and, uh, and has to act as a liaison to school committee so that they understand the pressures as well. I think it's really, I can, I really think it's important to be in, for the mayor to be in the room as a voting member invested in the outcomes and I, the reason I think they should be the chair is to allow those people who were elected as school committee members to fully participate in the process. Pat? I think it's important to understand that it's become the, the uh, habit uh, the, uh, to have uh, the mayor a more active participant in, in, in the uh, in, uh, school committee uh, in, in, in several different ways and, and for all the reasons that have already been, been pointed out here. However, it's now required by the, by the charter, and it's and, and prior to David's end, it really uh, for for the years leading up to so for, for the thirty years since since probably <coughs> half, it as a practical matter has been uh, has been the practice. Dave started out uh, doing it much less frequently than than all of his uh, than his successors have, but uh, prior to that it was done very infrequently and only usually at budget time. And that was due to the fact that autonomy existed in, in the school committee had an incredible amount of power as a result of that. I think the, the perspective is important, the historic perspective is important only because you're looking at this in the context of what exists now. And so that you, when, you make a, when you make a recommendation as to what we have as we go forward, I think while it's become the habit, and I agree with Stephanie, that any mayor that's going to get elected here is going to have a, a strong uh, education platform from which they're going to uh, gain support or else they're probably not going to get elected. All that being said, I don't think it's absolutely essential that we need to have 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 uh, uh, the mayor as a, a, as as active as some in the room might might feel. I think a resource, as David earlier described, um, uh, in, in relation to the uh, to the suggestion with respect to the council, is uh, is maybe another way to to consider that that involvement. Because Claire's point and Mary's point and David's, I'm sure, is, is that they need to feel comfortable with their grasp of what's going on there at, 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 as a function of the total uh, impact on the city. Easy to understand, but you know, I, I don't know that other than out of habit and, and, and uh, that we've gotten to the point where we're, this is the kind of discussion that we're having tonight. I think that the charter suggests something very different from the practice. Moving on, and I recognize that we are right at our time limit, but I want to continue with a few more areas just to get some brief comments. Length of term, term limits, and recall are all three things that came up in the last two hearings. Does anybody have any burning areas that they want to comment on? Should there be term limits on school committee members? Should there be a right to recall of school committee members? Um, uh, a staggered term here should should, should the, the staggered term then thank you. Um, that right now you've got your four years for your ward and two years for your at large and you run odd segments there. Anybody want to comment on any of those areas because there are lots of public opinions on this? And I'll start with Mr. Dostal. Uh, I, I see actually three positions that could be expanded to four-year positions. Uh, uh, that's the two city councilors at large and the mayor's position. I think both of uh, those uh, would go well I also think that the charter should be expanded so that the number of people that have to sign the petition should be up to 150 instead of 50 for those positions. Other comments in this area? Uh, Steve, do you want to add something? No. Okay. Other comments in this area? Stephanie? So when it comes to school committee members, um, I, I listened to the forum that you had last time and I heard what people were saying about term limits for city councilors. And so one I would say if we're going to have um, four year terms that I would definitely keep it staggered. I think that's very important that you don't have that you that you have some consistency um, so that you don't lose too many people at once. 
Um, but I will also say that I, I, I can't help but wonder if the four-year term is really off-putting for people in terms of being okay. willing to run. Um, I was really disappointed by how few people ran this year. Um, we had two seats open for at-large and two people ran. Um, we had one in War two and one person ran. You know, we all like to think, those of us who are incumbents, that we, nobody ran against us because they're happy with the job that we did. It's more apathy, I think. I'm not, or, you know, maybe they are, I don't know. Um, but we don't, we don't have a lot of hotly contested races. And um, um, I find it disappointing because I think debate really brings out what the big topics are. And I think that's a way for the constituents to know who it is they're really voting for and why. Um, so I, I can't help but wonder if the four-year um, term is too long. And it wouldn't be better served for the three-year term. To share some of the thinking that has been long. expressed. It's too fast. Um, if you go to a four-year mayoral race, what happens in that odd year? Because the turnout will drop. So one of the thought was to put the two at-large city council in that odd, uh, you know. So um, in 2011, we would go to the mayor. In 2013, you elect city council for four years. Um, the question came up about the school committee is it was sort of backwards because why are the ward people running for a four-year term? Why the, is that decreasing the number of people coming out, and should maybe the at-large be four years and the ward be two, like, city, like proposed for city council. Do you have any comments on that piece of it? I haven't thought about it that way, so I'm not sure of um, Running every two years, I'm, not, I'm in the, I'm starting year 11 out of 12. Yeah. Um, running every two years, I think would, I think it's too short a term. To have that many people potentially turning over that often, I, I think would be. Um, so you are you advocating that for all city, all school committees? I'm not before? advocating for anything particular. I okay. hope that what what the charter ends up doing with city council and school committee is um, connected somehow, so that it doesn't it doesn't allow a, a particular election year to have too few um, races on there for people to turn out. We have we have enough trouble with turnout as it is. And how do you feel about four years for your at-large? I mean, I just think it's funny that, that that's just opposite of what I would normally think. Yeah. And I just wondered, how's that working for you guys? You have to talk to the at-large people. First. Okay. Um, I've only ever been a ward, a ward rep. Yeah. Um, and four, I mean, four years is just a big chunk. You yeah. have to really think, four years out, where am I, you know, where am I at that point? Right. Um, three years doesn't seem as hard. Two years, it, it's a fast turnaround. Um, but I'm not sure I have a strong feeling at this point about that. Mr. Vito, how are you this fine interpreter? Very good. How would you like your sin? My name is Michael Vito. I'm a resident of Florence. I'm the former chief aide to former mayor Mary Ford. Uh, I left there in 1997 uh, to go work for U.S. Senator John Kerry uh, for several years. And uh, during that time frame, at one point, I was senator's liaison to all 1246 mayors. Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, in terms of limits, I would really hope that you would look at letting the executive run for four years. Um, as the mayor's aide, it was very hard to concentrate on really the issues at hand for the city, things that we started. Sometimes it was just too disruptive when campaigns came and went. I just think it's very fair, uh, since the, you are representing the entire community's interests, that you go four years. Um, or at large seats, I would um, because it is the legislative branch, either three or four. Some communities do three, I believe, uh, for at large seats. Um, I believe that's how they might do it in Weymouth. I know that was a. Green, just uh, Greenfield, that's it. Greenfield is the only one. Yeah, we, we, have have to, have, we have to have elections in May. Okay. That's a weird. That's a logistical problem we can talk about when you finish, but go ahead. It's a logistical mm -hmm. one, but it's something I think you should think about. But I think if you're going to go citywide, um, it is a much bigger commitment to run citywide. Uh, for those who are running for simple ward seats, you're representing a much smaller constituency. Um, I do think that two years is fine. I think that would be expected. Um, the other thing I also concur with um, former Councilor Dostal is that if you are going to run citywide, you should have more signatures. Um, if you're rep again, you're representing um, the whole city. You should have at least 150 signatures to get on the ballot. Um, I think that's fair. I think for the ward seats, you should stay you know, right around the same. Other comments in that area? Pat? Um, just to weigh in quickly on the uh, 
in the mayor's term, I agree that you have four years. I think that the reasons that Mike has stated and others that are uh, absolutely true. And I think that the position has evolved uh, in such a way that it is important uh, that uh, uh, we have a, uh, uh, a uh, that the, the person in that position have enough time to uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, understand the requirements of it and, and put in place a program for the city that is is um, something that can have some impact whereas if you're in every two years it's a it's a it can be as Michael described very disruptive but if you're going to do that and I think that you should and, and if you change the council uh, to the arrangement that we previously discussed about having a council president I think it's important uh, run the city council meetings I think it's important those terms be two years because that will be where the action is as far as the community is concerned they'll have a chance to weigh in, they being the people, will have a chance to weigh in every two years on whether they feel that what has been coming forth from the city council is a reflection of what they want to see or not. And I think that uh, we're talking about a person in a mayor's position who is, a, is an administrator, as all practical purposes, is a, a manager of, of, of the city, who need some uh, uh, tenure there to be able to uh, um, uh, uh, work in the best interest of the city, and I think that, uh, uh, however, if the council, as I said, is going to be uh, chaired by the council president, then I think that uh, those should be kept for two years, and uh, that more that's much more accessible to the community. David, well, nobody's tackled term limits. Yeah, go there. <laughs> um, well, what, what what concerns me is in, in in our last election, there was only one contested council seat out of seven. So one out of seven actually had a race. Um, my concern is that these aren't the most sought after <laughs> positions in a community, you know. It's, it's, I don't know how many comments I get from people after a, a long Thursday night meeting. It's like, how do you sit there? I mean, how do you do that? You know, you, you must have been very evil in a previous life <laughs> have to be on the council. So I, elections are term limits, and I think it, for that, that purpose, I think it could be counterproductive. If, if, if willing people who, are, who are, are broken in and can still cope with it are willing to stick around, you shouldn't have to say, you got to get that out you know, just, just because of term limits. Uh, I am worried about the issue that came up earlier about separating and, and, and setting up a scenario where you have off-year elections, because you can, and you know, we've seen it in, in the three elections I've been through to this point, if you don't have a mayor's race, people don't come out. Mm -hmm. And if people don't come out, you can get some pretty wacky ward results um, you know, even if it, it you got to have the voters without people at the polls, you never know what's going to happen. So to separate us and and potentially have a have have ward council races with no no at large races or no, or no good mayor's race and no one comes out, can, can, you can get some pretty wacky results. Um, ward wards are usually about a thousand voters, you know, over a thousand voters, uh, and that was in this election cycle with a very active mayor's race. Yeah. If you didn't have an active mayor's race, you could have 500 votes in a ward. I mean, I've never seen how low they get, but they get pretty low sometimes if nothing's really going on. And, and you could have some, some pretty strange results. Um, I don't, on one hand, I was interested in, in Stephanie's opinion that, you know, as a ward, a ward school committee person, she thought four years was quite reasonable. Um, because people sometimes may say, as a volunteer, maybe you don't want to commit for more than two, but her feeling is that four is perfectly fine. Um, I just like to see us all stay together. That way, you're going to have potential for enough citywide races that people will actually show up and, and vote if they're going to the awards. Claire? So, I think term limits are, are that's what we have elections for. I, I think it's not a good idea. Secondly, I think we do want a four-year term, but I would suggest to Mayor Narkowitz that he not say that he's for that because most of the mayors I know who supported the four-year term then didn't get a four-year term at the end of the election. <laughs> <laughs> so we're <laughs> staying in the position of thinking of Mayor Yusevich from Salem who campaigned on a four-year term and then lost the election for a four-year term. So, mm -hmm. um, but I do think a four-year term makes sense. And I also think that I think that all the councils should be two-year terms. I think, it, um, I think that the way this, I think it can, when you have a, a four-year mayor, there, you know, it's the, it's the midterm election. People get to send a message to the mayor in the midterm through the council elections. Mm -hmm. It may actually result in good council elections 
having more meaning midterm if there's if because there'll be some it, there may be some issues. So I think it's fine to do that. And thirdly, I 100% agree with an increased number of signatures for um, citywide elections. We have spent a lot of money on elections where, and we had one election in particular where the re signature requirement was 50, and when the election was run, the person got less votes than the signature. <laughs> so we spend $15,000 on a citywide election and a mayoral primary, so the person can get less votes than the signatures. I don't think that's, you know, I think 150 is a reasonable threshold if you want to be the chief elected official or a city councilor at large of a city of 30,000. Hey, yeah. um, and, and this might, you might be able to do this with the ordinance, but if you split up council terms in, in your infinite wisdom, um, remember what, then what is a session? Because right. right now a session is two years. If you split and you have some four-year councilors and some two-year councilors, you, you want to define a session, because you right. could elect a city council president who doesn't survive right. the second half of this right. session. So you want to just coordinate those two things. If you split them up, maybe the session is a two-year session there's based a, on the shortest There's a group term. dynamic issue there, yeah. too, yeah. where you have some serving four and some serving two. How does that upset kind of the balance of power? And you know, i got a four-year term, you only have a two-year term. And I don't know of any city council in Massachusetts that has has, has four and two. And not many school committees either. I think this might be the only one. In terms of school committee, what I've heard is people are confused every year about who they're voting for. That is, it, is it like, the odd or the even? <laughs> right. I mean, people don't understand the system. And you know, so don't make it more confusing than, than, than you have to. Nobody's picked up on recall. Anybody want to go there? Dave, do you want to add anything? <laughs> 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 we'll you stop that guy at John McLaughlin? Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a question about Chilowitz? Well, he, yeah, I saw his hand first. Oh, no, sure. Where do you want to go, please? No, I just was going to say, before I invoke my Fifth Amendment uh, <laughs> for your term, uh, that I, I'm opposed to term limits. Uh, and, but again, just more as a philosophical matter, I've always, you know, when I've worked in Congress, it was the same way. I, again, I just think it's, uh, I think we have one example at the federal level of term limits, and that was, that was political. Some of the same folks who proposed that were quickly trying to repeal it when Eisenhower was president, when Reagan was president. So I think it's, uh, I think it's political. Um, so, and then the other issue is I also firmly agree that the that the um, that the signature requirement should be raised, and probably there might even be it might be good to have a ward requirement in terms of if you're running at large to have so many signatures within each ward, because um, you you know you it's it's pretty easy to get 50 signatures. So I think that should definitely that, that bar should be raised, um, and I'll let others talk about that. No, um, circling back to Pat's point earlier, that you don't want to do anything that's going to screw up Ian's charter approval. Yeah, um, well, I'm not in pretty good shape. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get a lot of attention on that. <laughs> um, if we were to try to push for a four-year mayoral term, a potentially controversial stance to take. Mm -hmm. um, Concerned that there's a, certainly a constituency in town that is uh, saying that the mayor has too much power, that might be an expansion of power of some sort. Um, do the folks here who are for it think that it's so important to push for it that it would be worth balancing that with a term limit, perhaps even a three term term limit, to say at least um, we're not trying to make sure it's unchecked by our own power here? We're thinking that might make it go down easier. My point was more directed at individual positions, where you talk about changing the way the city clerk um, is, uh, the city clerk position, whether it's an appointed or elected right. position, those are the kind of things that I think start to, to make for great controversy because of individuals involved. Uh, the four-year limit thing, uh, the four-year term, to me, is part of the revamping of government that, that uh, you're contemplating, and I think is, would not, I don't think any of the issues in and of themselves are going to be significant hot button issues until you start talking about people, you know, if, and, and that's when it starts to get more complicated. I'm, I'm sorry if I confuse that point. I think my other, my other reason for, for making that point at the beginning is because we've been doing this so often, you know, so I'm, I'm, it was only in the interest of come up with something here that can work 
and it can be well supported and, and, and addresses the kind of things. I mean, you're seeing a certain consistency here. I listened to the to the last public hearing, and there seemed to be <coughs> more agreement than disagreement on, on, on the questions that are that were being posed. It's, it then becomes a, a, a question of how it, how it's sold in the community by the by the uh, people who it's going to affect. And uh, I, I, I think the kind of things <laughs> talking about here are in most cases are long overdue. And again, going back to those notes I looked at today from 1972, honestly, it's it's the same. You know, I'm glad I kept such good notes because I'm looking at it and I said, this could have been two weeks ago. You know, and it really is. So I mean, these are things that have continued to come up and have come up and come up. And this is the opportunity to deal with them. But I appreciate your question. Claire? So I don't think you could just propose a four-year work term in a vacuum. So if it's packaged with some of these other changes that are being proposed, right. then it makes sense. I don't think you can just say four-year term, nothing else changes. If you say four-year term, mayor doesn't chair the council, right. there's a, a reorganization of the committees that the mayor serves or doesn't serve on, that there's, uh, you know, if there's some other pieces that you're looking at, I think it makes sense. Dave, and since nobody's really talked about recall, okay. you know, yeah, the, the problem with that is the minute that process starts, that individual is totally ineffective. I mean, the entire focus yeah. is on the recall. They can't perform their job. No, it, it, it basically, you know, de facto, until it's over, they're totally ineffective. They can't really do their job. It's, it's a very unfortunate thing. Um, and, and that would be my concern about putting that in the charter, is you really would cripple that elected position's ability to do their job uh, until, until the recall process was over with. My uh, concern on recall, and I'll just share it publicly now, even though I'm not supposed to, is that 30% uh, Mary remembers this very well, voted for an individual uh, for mayor. And with all due respect, that gentleman had absolutely no business running for or being the mayor of Northampton. And if 30% of the people of this town are willing to say, what the hell, that makes me very nervous. And when you look at a recall petition, I would just want to make sure that that number has to be pretty high because, you know, we could be recalling the mayor the day after he's elected. Uh, or, you know, as much as I agree with what's happening in Wisconsin, the day after the, the gentleman in Wisconsin, the governor of Wisconsin, was eligible for recall, but he's on the ballot. And as you said, he's now impotent. He's not able to do things. And that happened out in California to, you know, again, somebody who we might have all agreed with, and there might now it's happening in Wisconsin. And I don't know if that's the way we want to run government or move the future of government. Claire? I think the reason recall comes up is if you change the mayor's term to a four-year term, people are concerned about that, and I get that. The reason not to have the citywide, other citywide positions go to four years is because in that midterm election, people could send a pretty clear message to the mayor uh, that that's when they can send that message and that hopefully it can be a course correction. If the mayor is doing something more than be the thing that people are happy about. But if it's something illegal, then it's a whole different thing that right. has to be kicked in. It's right. not about recall, it's about a uh, legal process. So, but I, I don't think you should have four-year at-large positions and a four-year mayor term. I think you need to have that course correcting midterm Other comments in any of the areas we've talked about? Any other comments from the people on, Michael? Just one, uh, just in closing. Um, you know, since I was working in City Hall back in 1997, there have been so many improvements. I mean, you know, the internet, which we did not have, opened up a whole new world for efficiency. And we've already heard the state start talking about things like, you know, regionalization. We don't know where things are going to be 50 years from now. I, I really do see um, someday, you know, whether it be the Secretary of State's office or someone else, taking on a lot of the functions that we might perform now. Um, even, you know, we're already seeing things at the, at the county levels with the registries of deeds. There's legislation to take some of the uh, counties that have two, maybe three, and fold them together. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, Northampton is already doing some functions uh, for some of the surrounding hill towns. I'd just like to see the charter, the final product, be flexible, a real good, strong home rule petition, so that when things do come up, we can address them you know, in, a, in a better manner than we have been. 
And keep in mind that you know this document is from 1883. Mm -hmm. We weren't able to change it in 1972. I was 10 years old. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for context. I was getting ready to retire. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I, I, I have a question for Steve. Uh, and this is kind of relative to the recall question and something will come up and I don't have the answer to it. Um, what does uh, a felony conviction do to your electability in Massachusetts? Are there any statutes about criminal convictions that make you uneligible for elected office? If you're incarcerated, you, 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 you are being forced. The proposed language we have now is we see a lot of charges. If you, if you finally convict of a felony, you have been deemed to vacate the office. So we put that right into the chart. But the incarceration thing is a state law. You can't you serve your own incarceration. Well, <laughs> once you have served, you're, st you're about to be eligible. That's right. It is. It's a, it's, it, Patrick just said it's the James Michael Curley law yeah. in honor of the esteemed. You can bar somebody for life. Yeah. You can do that. In you your charge. Yeah. No, but so essentially, if you, once, you, once you've made your peace with the Commonwealth and served your time, you again become eligible. Now, I'm going to tell you that if you put a bar in, to the kind of charter for someone who has been convicted and has been in for some parts of the city, that is going to be a thing that they're not going to like. I think to keep it as simple as possible is the best way to go. And I was just interested in clarification of what the, the problem laws of the Commonwealth address that. So. I, think it, I think it makes sense to say if somebody is convicted, they have been in effect vacated the office. And if they, they're in prison, clearly they can't serve. Right. Right. That's, that's my operational statement. A permanent, a permanent bar, I think, just made by a debate that you might not want to have in our liberal progressive community where people are going to say, well, you know, why have a bite? Um, any other issues from the uh, gallery that you've already guessed would like to comment on? I thank you not only for your time tonight, but your service to our community. Sure. I appreciate you coming in. Is there anything that this body needs to address before we adjourn until January 9th, I believe, Mary, correct? We are back in this room at 5 o'clock for a marathon, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Pardon? They're in council chambers. Pardon? They're in council chambers. Council chambers. All four meetings are in council chambers. Pardon? Thursday. Thursday would be, it's, a, it's the, yes, yes. This is the second Thursday. So all four will be in council chambers. We'll be starting to take votes on that particular time. Um, Steve and Mary and I will be sending you some homework to do some reading over the holiday season. And what's the, refresh me again, what's the rule on sharing ideas between now and then? No. Is that even through Mary? Steve, I'm going to defer to you. I'm, I don't, I'm really not an open meeting law expert, so I'm, I don't Dave, we were talking I'd rather about defer on the, on the uh, side of caution. If you were going to, if someone wants to write a memo and give it to the clerk and have it and the other people see it, that's fine. You just can't have a discussion on it. You can't deliberate on it. So you can we provide share an idea. You can, but it, it has to be provided as sort of administrative ministerial materials for I a meeting this, at uh, which you're going to discuss. Here's the clarifying point on this. Here's the whatever. But you do not want to open up a dialogue right, right. via electronic mail. Right. You want to stay away from that because that is a clear violation, which is again another red flag that could be used by opponents yep. to derail the process. Okay. So just take the holiday, do your own reading, keep your thoughts to yourself, <laughs> and we can have a dialogue. Okay. Let's not get ourselves into any little trouble here. Maddie, no, I'm just going to say, if question? you send something that's super provocative, it's going to be hard for people not to respond to. Right. So just keep your thoughts to yourself, <laughs> enjoy life. Thank you all for attending.